Yeah, she's not coming. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening for tonight's village committee meeting. Today is October 9th, 2017. We'll call this main order at 731. Uh, clerk, can you call the roll, please? Sure. Trustee McGrill? Here. Trustee Dalzell? Here. Trustee Pierce? Here. Trustee Zielinski? Here. Trustee Juarez is absent this evening. Trustee McLawhorn? Here. Mayor Ryan? Here. We have a quorum. Thanks. Can you please join us on the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Uh, this evening, Board, we've got a handful of presentations. We've had a busy month here in the village, and now that we've actually, uh, so the public understands as well, too, now that we've reduced our meetings uh, with regard to committee to once a month on committee, twice on board meetings, we try to consolidate a lot of these tasks into one meeting. Uh, I've asked the different folks uh, this evening on the agenda that have to make presentations to obviously consolidate their presentations as best they can to obviously be cognizant of the time. Uh, board, at this time, I'd like to ask, unless anybody has a problem, um, it is a professional courtesy, if I can take some of these, I'd like to take some of these items out of order to facilitate some of the folks in the audience. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, because we've, we've got a handful of folks here. Uh, I kind of, and just so everybody knows, I kind of did this on a first come, first serve of, of folks that I know we, we've already had, had meetings with. Uh, the first one then this evening, uh, if we would, Please, if we can hear from uh, John from um, Affiliated Ma um, Realty Management, John. Okay, and this is this is your PowerPoint up here on the screen. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Trustees. Uh, my name is John Bovary. I'm with Affiliated Realty and Management. We're a management company, and we currently manage a strip shopping center down at Pulaski at 12202 South Pulaski. I think. Uh, most of you are familiar with the JJ Mini Mart and the uh, uh, burrito, taco burritos, and, and the uh, Chinese restaurant and, and that in there. Um, we're before the committee today. I'm going to try to encapsulate this pretty quick. Uh, as you can see, there's the plaza. It was built in 1972. Currently, there's eight leasable spaces, 14,000 square feet of gross leasable space. We have five retail stores, two service providers and a vacancy rate of 8%. Uh, it's a little deceiving, though, because uh, sometimes we make deals to keep people in in tough economic times. So uh, the return on investment sometimes isn't always the best. And we've approached ownership when we heard about the, the possibility of TIF money to try to improve the street appearance, which would benefit the ability to lease and retain better tenants within the stores that are there. It is a prime location, we feel, on Pulaski as you enter LSIP, as you ascend down the railroad bridge at 115th. You, you really see that whole plaza. It's not set back. It's in a little L shape there. And it's a day the blue was cutting edge, we might say. Uh, it's, it's seen its days, though. I think it's started to fade, and it's starting to show its age. And that's just not a thing that we see on the street too much anymore. Um, we're going to try to stay current. We'd like to see signage improved. And that's one of the items that we have line item that you'll see in the, in the, in the proposal for a monument sign that meets the new s city's criteria. Uh, we want to keep it attractive as possible and most of all safe. Um, with uh, We're looking to bring it to a more clean, new, classic look that is a thin brick that's added to the building. We do have some elements of drive it that will enhance uh, the larger tenant to try to break up the roof line a little bit instead of this straight L-shaped plaza. We're going to give it a little bit of a kick out and a little change in color transition. Uh, we're going to play with the brick color a little bit. We haven't settled 100% on that. We have two different colors that we're looking at that are very similar, just little different nuances um, to the uh, face of the building. Uh, it's going to depend upon what we feel when we see it on the street in comparison to everything around it. 
Uh, these are just the drawings of what we have here. It's going to be brick and drive it. We're going to raise the roof line in several locations there. And you have a packet in front of you, which I have everything on here. So if you want to go back at a later date to look at it, you can. Um, there we have a monument sign that would pretty much give you what the appearance is going to be right there on, on the uh, edge of the property in, on Pulaski there as you drive down. And uh, you can see the elevations where we're raising the roof line a little bit. And uh, let's get down to the, the real meat of this presentation here is uh, the actual cost of the project. Uh, in the last page of your packet, I do have uh, two pages that I have, which has this, which gives a full breakdown so you can look through that line by line if you're interested. Um, it's The total is $374,990. Um, uh, in the last month, we've added about $100,000, give or take, uh, with new storefronts. We think that uh, new storefronts are pivotal. They're very aged. It's very tired. It's old plate glass. Our tenants, it's a constant complaint and issue that they bring up with. And if you look at our competition on the street, everybody has nice new storefronts. They're appealing. We have a hard time bringing people in with vision uh, nowadays. Uh, so we're, we're trying to upgrade the appearance for potential tenants, upgrade the appearance for the current tenants, and have an overall uh, attractive center for a shopper's experience. Uh, people don't want to go down to run down old buildings. They go to other nice new shinier businesses on, on other streets. Here's where we're looking is our real request here is to share in the cost through the TIF program. We're going to request if we could have a 50-50 split on this cost sharing of the total cost here. Trustees, please keep in mind too, myself and Trustee Pierce met with John before. John represents the management company that oversees the, the strip mall you're looking at for everything except for the Pappas restaurant. So this kind of starts at, at the... Um, Mini Mart, the JJ Mini Mart. At the JJ Mini Mart and, and continues all the way around to the Burrito King at Correct. the other end of the strip Correct. mall. So again, facade improvements so that the public understands too, so facade improvements are TIF eligible expenses and currently we do have a TIF available on Pulaski and based on that $374,000 number uh, is obviously uh, John's company is asking that we share half the cost of that. That is correct. To enhance the look of that property with a new facade including new storefront and signage as well as obviously stimulating additional growth in that strip mall to begin. You know, oh, definitely. Uh, currently yeah. we, we're at 8% vacancy rate. We have uh, one that's completely vacant. It used to be an old laundromat. And uh, we have another tenant there that is a, uh, a truck driving school. And he's basically on a month to month. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, for various reasons he's indicated to us that he's questioning if he's going to stay or not. And it's it's difficult to attract new businesses into an older building. And we're concerned to that. And that's why we're trying to convince both the village and the property owners to invest in this. This real, and again, for the benefit of the board and the public, and especially everyone in house right now, uh, when you're leaving tonight's meeting in the back of the room on the two easels that we have, we've got two conceptual ideas that we had an architect draft for us to help give guidance to potential strip, well, not potential, potential ideas to strip owner, owners in town of ideas that they can do with their strip malls. And this is real close to what we had over in there as far as color concept and whatnot then too. So it does kind of follow the idea of what we'd like to see on Pulaski then too. Um, neutral colors and certainly an upgraded look from the blue awnings and so forth to the, the brick look with some drive it and stucco on there then too. So. Uh, and, John, you you had told me in, in our last meeting, myself and Trustee Pierce, that uh, you've got some ideas for lighting as well, too. So it's not just the facade, Correct. but we, you're going to have plenty that of lighting. Part of that we haven't looked into in the line items. Some of it we did because of the great increase 
I have to sell to some of the owners on that. Uh, but we are looking because when you put a new plaza in like this, uh, there's a pole light there that we definitely would be changing to LED. We might okay. not even include. Well, I can see the lights right here in the corner. Yeah, too. Sure. So, okay. that we might not even be including in this part of the package. This would be strictly uh, in-house through the property owners and through tenancy. Uh, there's strip lighting underneath the, the, the walkways there. And we're currently looking, researching into different types of LED lighting for the walkways uh, at night for less lights in the wintertime tend not to work as well. Uh, LED works better at even when it's colder temperatures. We want to enhance that for security purposes. Uh, we, we live in a world nowadays that we have to all be conscious about our safety and security, and we're no different. Uh, we don't want to see anything misfortune happen to customers or our, our tenants. Sure. And uh, that's part of it. Uh, we do have a business there, several businesses that are open late at night. So we want to make sure that is taken care of. Another reason why we want to grind and overlay the parking lot is to eliminate any kind of hazards that could occur. The, this property is, like I say, built in the 70s, and it's, it's showing its age dramatically. Mm. This estimate takes into account prevailing wage, right? Yes, it does. It's okay. Um, and then as far as your expectation of starting and finishing? Well, I look at it, it's no more than a six-month process, but, it, you know, we're, we're now in October. We do have some documents to facilitate and an agreement to come with the village, so that's going to take a little time. And I'm not going to be doing storefronts in the middle of December, and I know I can't get asphalt after October until April 15th when the yards open again. So I'm looking probably a early spring start to the project when the weather breaks to do most of the structural work and the brick facade in the face. And then on the back end of the job, more than likely doing the storefronts and the parking lot and monument sign when the weather breaks for the spring. So we would say a January, February start up and finish in April, May barring any kind of unforeseen delays, but we know with weather we can never predict it in Chicago here. Uh, but uh, we do work through the winter. I've done one in Minneapolis in the middle of December. Uh, of course, it just keep to a timeline that, that's reasonable. Any other questions, board, for right now? Roger, is this the uh, same facade that coincides with the rest of the Pulaski Corridor? Yes, this is um, this is really, you know, just uh, um, evidence that it's a very similar approach. It's not going to look the same because you want to maintain some individuality between different properties and different merchants along the corridor, but it does uh, represent increasing the, uh, um, d you know, a slightly different individuality for these merchants and this shopping center compared to the other ones. And so you're going to see a similar pattern. You know, you're going to see something like what you have back here with, um, you know, the 116th and uh, 117th um, Street uh, properties. Um, and this one is going to be just uh, another good example. It's going to be better than just the drive-it facade that you have across the street because there you have kind of a continuous drive-it appearance with just the only – Individuality there is just the individual uh, names of the uh, tenants. And this is going to create a little more individuality, at least for JJs. And then depending on how the other tenants, uh, you know, have their signs uh, repositioned on the wall, you know, they'll gain their own individuality that way. That's another factor. We minimize the drive it because of next door to the south there at Papa's. I didn't want to just be a continual line similar. At the same time, across the street, the color of brick that's in the building to directly to the west of us. So we're playing with between two different colors. Uh, you know, This version, a little darker red, and then there's another version that has a little bit of a, a gray slate color to it, but it still has the red to it. So it gives it a little uniqueness than just a standard red brick or a standard clay colored brick. So we, we, we play with colors a little bit um, and break up the rough line a little bit. And so it, it, it is a little different, but it, it still comes to more of a, a, a contemporary, a, a more of a modern, classic look. Oh, it's good, John. And actually, based on 
your neighbor there at Pappas, it, these will complement each other because his look, he's got the drive it look on his place. Exactly. Right now then too. Yeah. So, no, it should look great. Anybody else? John, thanks much. And um, certainly that's the idea of a committee where we can have a little Q&A here real quick. Sure. And I'll, I'll certainly ask uh, Trustee Pierce to be in charge of putting this on agenda for approval at some point then too, okay? All right, that's fine. I thank you okay. very much Could for you the sign in, please? Thank you very much for the opportunity, and I tried to make it as quickly as possible as sure. I see you, uh, have quite, you, know, you have quite we a full that. agenda. Yeah, no, no problem. Next, can we uh, hear from... Uh, Frank Deliberto here. Yes. Frank, can you can you address the board on uh, your your services too? Sure, sure. Oh, no problem. <laughs> and and for the board and for the audience. Obviously, uh, I've asked Frank Deliberto here this evening. Frank represents Deliberto De Realty, and uh, we've uh, we've been told by our economic development group that currently the project I'm asking Frank's company to identify with is the selling aspect of properties that the village acquired on Pulaski Road. Uh, we've actually come in contact with four properties that we're currently trying to close on. Once those are closed upon, uh, our economic development group, they don't do closings. They're not realtors. So we need to contract with a realtor to do so, which is why I've asked Frank to come this evening and talk to the board about his company and, and to see if we if we can get approval to engage with uh, Deliberto Re Realty for the selling aspect of the recent property acquisitions like I explained. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Again, I'm Frank Deliberto with the Deliberto Real Estate. And uh, today we are addressing a couple opportunities. Uh, the, the first is uh, to request represent, representation uh, for those properties on Pulaski Road. Uh, we, we do believe that uh, Pulaski Road is you know, what we like to call a gateway corridor. And uh, so the specific assets uh, uh, that we're talking about are, again, noted in the back of the room, as Mayor suggested, and we're prepared to uh, take on that assignment to uh, not only pro forma these properties, but also to uh, create some value there that might not be there. You know, these are major uh, corridors, and it's not, uh, in our opinion, it's not about uh, focusing on just what can be done uh, in an individual property, but it's setting a vision for the entire corridor uh, of Pulaski Road. So in addition to you know, closing the real estate and going through due diligence, we can also uh, bring financing and bring capital and bring tenants and all these things to bear um, as we move forward, uh, ad addressing these things uh, you know, in, in, you know, from a short-term and long-term assignment. We talk about realizing uh, the potential uh, you know, LSIP is a uh, tremendous uh, corridor from Cicero Avenue to Pulaski and everywhere in between. And our, our vision, in addition to Pulaski, you know, which is, of course, our first vision and our first mission to, to work on the Pulaski corridor, but we're also asking uh, the village to open um, a door to discuss how we might do similar things or identify other assets. There's about 25 assets that we've identified um, in the village that can be as instrumental as we move forward, you know. And so, you know, we, we talk about, and I believe, Mayor, you have a package that's been presented to the trustees. So you, you can look at this, but, um, and we can also take qu questions on this, but um, our company w would be addressing all of the different um, uh, opportunities in the village. Can we move forward on the, thank you. Uh, today, uh, real estate is, is taking a major turn, and investors that we work with every day um, look at these opportunities in real estate as more of an investment, per se, than they have in the past. And so understanding uh, uh, and doing a pro forma on what these corridors can mean in terms of a return on investment for retailers will allow us to bring in regional and even national tenants. Um, by understanding what the return on the investment will be. So our suggestion is to 
to treat it as such and look at these major properties and major corridors um, and, and articulate what the um, what the investment means to outside money coming in. And that's something, again, that, that we would suggest um, doing uh, as we move forward. Fellas? Uh, so, you know, our background is in accounting, investment banking, financing, and real estate. And uh, we think that this is important uh, to have as well uh, in, uh, in accomplishing some of these goals. So a few of the, uh, again, this would equate to uh, what we would do in the Pulaski Corridor, uh, as well as other opportunities. But in, in, on Pulaski, again, targeting opportunities and with specific specificity to properties, um, evaluating and then adding value by creating something that's not there. So our ambition would be to, in addition to, I mean, great ideas on the facades and how the aesthetics would look on these properties, and at the same time, address who the tenants would be and identifying the profiles that fit and going after folks that we haven't seen on these corridors. Uh, again, regional and national tenants. Uh, marketing and selling. Go back to that one real quick. Thank you. Uh, marketing, selling, and leasing is, is, is all about, uh, you, you know, what we're talking about doing here is to identify and then also to give the village an opportunity to execute a plan in a specific timeline. So if, if the village wants to come in and, and see a timeline from you know, month one to month six, we can identify and we can react to a specific timeline as opposed to you know, putting properties on the market and languishing. You know, these are deals that have to move quickly, and we would suggest adding a timeline so that you know, whether it's the facade improvements or bringing tenants or selling and, you know, and, and you know, reaping a profit from a particular deal, um, we would recommend a specific timeline. Okay, Phyllis. Uh, you know, the, you have in the packet uh, uh, areas that we've worked in and for, and um, so that will just, you know, uh, allow you to put that in the file. But there's a, a great many cities that we've represented over 25 years. Mr. Dillaberta, which, yes, which packet are you referring to? Because I, I, this is all I have. That was, that was a lot of blank pages. Oh, it was, a, it was the, this PowerPoint presentation. That was email. Email. Yeah. Oh, the email. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. It, it's actually exactly what you're looking at right okay. now, too. Yes. It is. I can't see that far. <laughs> that, you know, and trust me, that's why I didn't yeah. make copies. I, I knew we were going to look at this again, okay. but I, I emailed everybody the same PowerPoints. Thank you. So you can look at that. Um, but working with municipalities is is uh, is uh, really a, a specialty because it, it it's a, a conduit between the, the private sector and and the public sector and helping you know individual owners to, to to do what's right you know you may have situations where owners let properties languish on the market and they're in need of an att of attention um, we help to be a conduit to help that happen fellas again. In, in our line of work, uh, what we're suggesting is um, to utilize the letters of intent and letters of interest that we have from users that, um, you know, would be ideal to take space in these properties. So ahead of time, you know, we're working with um, uh, regional and national tenants that have an appetite for taking space in these markets, and we use that information and those contacts to more quickly, you know, get tenants into these properties, which are key again. You know, if you make an investment in a property, you want to know what the return is on it, and knowing who's going to be there and the tax revenue that's generated obviously becomes an important, uh, you know, aspect of the decision. Uh, so, in in our representation, we would suggest a interactive timeline so that uh, this, the village can see uh, uh, what is happening on a daily basis, or weekly basis, a monthly basis, and and build that into. Uh, an understanding of what's happening uh, so that, uh, you know, in these presentations everybody is, uh, you know, kept in forum as the days go by and then we can address the issues and questions as it would arise. Um, and, you know, the engagements can be anywhere from a few months to six months or a year and, and, and forth. Okay, so this I can't see, but the, the idea here is <laughs> is uh, we would be bringing uh, experience in development, experience in in in, uh, in TIF consulting, and working with your you know TIF uh, attorneys and um, economic development and uh, investment banking and financing. All of these things become an integral part of a real estate exercise, 
and um, uh, you know we think it would it would add a tremendous amount of opportunity because again we look at this as a triple-a city um, that is underutilized and we think it's because uh, you know we're just not getting what would be rightfully or should be coming to the to the village um, from outside investments and users and uh, and the tenants that we really rightfully should have um, on these corridors, whether it be Pulaski, which borders the city, which is you know phenomenal corridor, um, or Cicero Avenue, uh, which is in the middle of everything. Uh, these are the components uh, that would uh, be part of what we would bring to the village, um, and we can you know customize uh, that service to fit whatever need you might have. So with that, I again I appreciate the opportunity to to represent this, uh, uh, our, our plan, and we would, uh, uh, you know, be happy to work for the village and, on this assignment. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Frank. Um, trustees, keep, please keep in mind, I wanted to just Mr. Delabroto to introduce himself this evening and who his company was. Uh, should we decide to engage with, with uh, Mr. Delabroto's services, uh, we certainly, Trustee Pierce, I'd recommend, a, a, you know, have a committee meeting where we can sit down, we can dis discuss fees and what we're able to afford. And um, certainly if, if everyone is in agreement, then we go to the next level of this. Right now, Frank, Fort, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, we haven't closed on the properties as much as we'd love to. We do have everything in place. There's a couple of issues that we're trying to deal with right now. And as soon as we get past those, we can close on these properties. But again, as we have committee meetings once a month, I didn't want to install this for a month and then push it another month for it just, God forbid, you know, let's just say you weren't available or something like that. So trustees, I wanted at least Frank to introduce himself because I, I, I do have confidence in your organization. Uh, you do have a, um, you, you do have roots here too. Your family's from, from the village and so forth and it's obviously, exactly, right. So I mean, you do have a vested interest in our community as well as a professional one. And um, no, I want to thank you for coming in today. And I'll, as I said, I'll defer to economic development for the next step but just so we can get you at least to introduce yourself to us and know what you can provide and so forth then, too. Any questions, Trustee, at this time? Anybody on this side? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you, you for the Frank. opportunity. Yeah, could you sign in for the clerk, please, so we know you spoke to us this evening? A um, couple of short uh, presentations here, folks, and then we're going to talk to our 911 consolidation person as well. Um, we do have somebody here from, you know, uh, we have Sal Tadros here this evening. Uh, Sal, do you have anybody come up? Sal, I'm sorry, too, what, what was the name of your organization? Uh, Captain Jacks. Right. Sal's here to represent, come on up, uh, Sal, you can take a microphone. This actually all gets recorded. That's why we ask folks to speak into a mic. Um, this is Sal Tadros. Uh, Sal and his brother represent Captain Jack's liquors, uh, beverages. I apologize. Right. Currently, um, Sal's company is building a remodeling to open a new facility in Worth, right? Sure, sure. So we're building, um, um, I can kind of give him an introduction. Sure. We're going to do. Okay. Good evening, Thank everybody you. Trustees. Um, good evening. Uh, well, you have to hold it really okay. close. Everybody hear me? All right. Um, so what we're building right now in Worth, we're building um, uh, one of five stores that we have um, funding to build. Um, it's approximately 6,000 square feet uh, beverage place that we're building in um, uh, Worth, Illinois. So it's going to have um, wines, champagnes, um, craft beers, spirits, uh, beer, um, and also walk-in cigar humidor. So we're going to be like uh, pretty much we're going to take um, we're going to take a shot at it and going after a mini binnies. Um, where it's going to be a 6,000 to 7,000 square foot uh, layout. Um, and what we do, we come in and we look at buildings that we feel have the structure, have the guts, and have the square footage uh, that, that we need in order to run our business efficiently and, and hopefully profit. Uh, we recognize the property on 116th and uh, Pulaski. Uh, the property does fit the square foot that we're looking for. And what we do with our properties is, you know, it's it's our property, so it's it's our kids. So we treat it correctly. We uh, we make sure we we dress the building up. We give it the wow factor that that's going on in the industry right now between the groceries and um, uh, fast food chains. If you're starting to realize that everybody's putting high end touches on every single item that's being touched, um, that's our specialty. Uh, we've been in business, family owned for 34 years, so it's not like we're doing this out of nowhere. Um, the property in Worth right now is going to cost us north. 
uh, when it's completed and fully stocked, north of $1.6 million, which is private money. Um, the property in uh, ELSUP would probably cost uh, similar give and take, plus or minus, possibly the same amount. So we're investing a lot of money and a lot of uh, time in these properties. Um, and we're coming to the village right now and asking for um, a license um, for the property on 116th and uh, Pulaski. Um, the biggest thing that we can bring to the village, and I know we can, is drawing traffic from Chicago, drawing traffic from Crestwood, drawing traffic from Marinette Park to come and shop in the village. Uh, we did our numbers already based on that location. Uh, we're estimating that location to do sales revenues within a five-year mark between two to $3 million in sales, bringing back some sales revenues to the village. I believe it's a 2% from um, from the sales. Is it 2% of Is sales that tax? Is that accurate, Kent? 2%. Two, two so, for, so projection-wise, I think if we're doing $2 million, that's um, back to the village of $40,000. That's not including also the real estate tax. Um, and also, if we hit $3 million, which would be great, would be uh, $60,000. That's going from um, a non-generating um, facility right now um, to going to a tax-generating facility that can bring great value um, to the village. So our, our approach is very simple. Before we go into contracts into purchasing the property, we would like your blessings um, to come in and open the second location um, of Captain Jackson Elsop. Keep in mind, too, uh Ladies and gentlemen, I provided something to the, to the board this evening that Sal and his uh, brother had provided with me. We had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we actually have a, a footprint of the Worth location here. And even the cigar uh, the walk-in humidor, I mean, this is substantial. You get a 12-foot 12, 12 by 15-foot room for that yeah, alone. Yeah, so I it's mean, a 12 by 15, so it's... Uh, it's, that's yeah. substantial it's, it's for, a, for a cigar yeah, room and stuff. Yeah, it's real nice. But, um, again, I, I, let's put it this way. Uh, while this is a change, there. this represents a change a, at that location, um, and for anyone questioning, uh, we, do have, uh, we do have parameters for liquor licenses, too. Now, currently, just so everybody understands, there are no liquor licenses available in our village. What I'm asking the board to consider is creating a liquor license for this facility uh, because of the fact that we need to broaden and diversify our opportunities to bring in sales tax revenue. As Mr. Tadros pointed out, you, you have a school there now that's on a month-to-month -month lease, uh, Sal? Y yes, right now they're on a month-to-month -month lease, and it's really hard for uh, we know the, the owner of that property. It's a little hard to sell that property if you don't have a tenant lined up, mm -hmm. especially based on the taxes on that property. Right. So and owner user, it's a little easier for us. So whether Just to be clear, you're the owner of the liquor store, not the strip mall itself. No, we would be the, the owner of Ultimately, the property as well. But you're speaking it. on behalf of the owner right now as far as that... as far as this daycare or this school? Well, the daycare right now, we have the lease in hand. It is month to month. So they, don't, they, they have not signed a long-term lease and they don't have intent to. Um, that's what I've seen from the lease. So, you, sir, you said your family has been in business for 34 years. Um, Correct. I, I do a lot of Internet research. I couldn't find anything on Captain Jack's. Captain so are you Jack's, under an LLC? or No, well, Captain Jack's is actually a new franchise. We're going to franchise model that we're building for the suburbs. We've been in the city of Chicago under INS, Wine and Spirits, so you can look that up as well. I can give you the address on that. So I, I look it up, but this $2 million, you know, Revenue production. Um, you what do you base that on? We base it on traffic count of Pulaski Road, which is twenty nine thousand, I think twenty nine or twenty eight thousand seven hundred between twenty twenty eight to twenty nine. Basic rule of thumb of any retail is three percent to four percent of traffic actually shops in on a daily basis, and we're basing it off the model that we use through our um, research and development that we did for Worth as well. It's almost a probably plus or minus a thousand. Uh, car traffic difference between Worth and this property, so and that's what we base it off of. Right. Will you be asking for gaming as well? Gaming is something that we will not live and die by. Um, it's not something that we ask for um, right now. I mean, can I say yes now? No, I don't need it right now. In the future, if we can create a, a destination spot where we feel that we can bring more tax revenue here and we can create a better vibe for our business, sure. Um, I think it can be, a, you know, we can bring it back to the table. But as of right now, for us, our bread and butter is our business. Uh, we've never dealt with gaming, um, and I, I don't know if I can ask for a yes or no right, right. now. Just Thank you. 
Also, folks, what I was going to allude to as well is myself and the building inspector reached out to Worth Township. They no longer offer uh, daycare at the facility. About 15 months ago, apparently they raised the cost for daycare, and nobody brought their kids anymore, so they eliminated daycare at Worth Township. That doesn't exist anymore. The only programs they would have there is maybe two months out of the year is day camp, and technically right now, on the ordinance, day camp is not recognized on the ordinance. So this would still have to be approved through legal. You know, it still has to go through channels. But um, we're not awarding any license this evening or even next week. What we're doing is we're asking the board to consider creating a license if that's what it came to, I mean, in order to facilitate your so request for a bill. Mayor, did you, I mean, so obviously this, if, if it did, this wouldn't, um, by ordinance, it wouldn't give the uh, amount of feet required between a school or what have you. But um, the day camp is one thing. Uh, did you talk to anybody at, at the at the Worth Township? I mean, I, I went over there tonight, and it's full of children with programs right now. So I, I'm just, I mean, yeah. besides the day camp, did you investigate any other programs that go on the, during the week there? They do have, they do have some, uh, sometimes they've got counseling classes. they got things like that. Uh, they've got different programs that they offer over there. But as far as instructional, that's what I'm saying. We'll, we can leave that to legal to define what is instructional. Okay. So, and then um, what else can I add to that? The uh, Yeah, there is a 300-foot rule. At, by state statute, it's only 100 foot. In the village of Alsip, they went to 300 feet back in like 07 or 08, something like that. So that we actually did make it a little bit further as far as um, proximity to a church or a school. That type of thing, yeah, too. So, and, um, and, and you did say daycare, not day camp, right? I just want to clarify that I you did told, say daycare. I, I spoke to the Ward Township committeeman, and he told me they're no longer offered daycare. Which committee man was that? That'd be John O'Sullivan. Okay, he's, he's I, a, I would, I would just trust that you would just even look online at the Ward Township offerings for the amount of, you know, child care things that go on during just every single day there. I mean, just just look on the line under the youth uh, youth services and look at all the different programs, from Lego clubs to to sports clubs to to hockey to everything that goes on inside that building every single day except for Sundays. Mm -hmm. I, I I just it baffles me that you 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 just say daycare. There's you, this 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 is not going to fit unless there's some legal you know some legal way around it. It is not going to fit the distance requirement. It's, it's a, well, the, the wording in the ordinance is instructional classes, is what it says. We still have to create the licenses, too. So I, I understand. I, I'm, I'm a strong, strong no because of the Worth Township. Mm -hmm. And I no do not see you, where sir. that packet was handed out. I did not have it in my... Oh, uh, I'll make sure I get you. You can actually have mine. We, these were all copies. Did, I, I didn't know if any of the other trustees yeah. had seen yeah, it. No, That's a, I was just looking through, and I can't find you didn't it. I, it was in your mailbox. I, because that, but there were so many things with all these presentations. There's nothing to today in the mailbox. Sal, thank you very much for coming in this evening. Any other questions, trustees? Okay. Sal, thank you very much. You can sign in, please, that, that you address the board. Thank you. Um, one one last short presentation here. Um, actually, we had two. Um, John from Funtime Square. John, I met on Friday. John, can you speak to the board for a moment on, on your request as well? Board, this is John and Dominic. You know, again, a gentleman, you have to speak in this mic because these are all recorded sessions that we have here then too. Uh, I met with John and Dominic on Friday. And John has owned Funtime Square for the past, what, 20 years? 20 years, John? And um, I'll, I'll let you speak for your Go ahead, and I can surmise if you wish. Yeah, I want uh, Funtime Square 20 years. Okay. And the reason John came before us this evening is uh, John asked if the board would consider letting him, well, the state considers, it's up to the state to give you gaming. And what John was saying was he feels he's at a, a um, a business disadvantage right now the, uh, for the fact that similar businesses like yours, like over in Crestwood is Hollywood Park. Uh, offer in Bridgeview. In, in Bridgeview as well, but businesses similar to yours are now offering gaming in their establishments. Now, in order to get gaming, you, you know, unfortunately the state makes 
has a business acquire I have a business license I'm sorry has a liquor license rather in this case let's say for beer and wine just to be consumed on promise and that's what the state is is saying you need to have as a prerequisite on the village side of life the village again we don't have a village we don't have a license available so the board would have to vote to create a license for you and even financially and the same thing holds true for anybody that wants to do gaming in their, in their business and I explained this to you Friday when we met is there's a fifty six hundred dollar fee for the license itself there's basically a, about a six hundred dollar fee to rezone the property there's a thousand dollar fee for the application so you're at seven thousand dollars there and quite possibly it was um, the trustee uh, Zlinski mentioned last week we're actually going to explore the idea of um, the common uh, a common practice right now for annual fees for licensing and gaming is about five hundred dollars per machine so there's about twenty five dollars in, in licensing so you're looking at about ten thousand dollar investment in, into this business and when I had spoke to these gentlemen about and that's why I wanted to come to the board and just make your case and with the board as well was the idea that certainly while well, we want to support your business it's, it's a great business it's been there for 20 years I moved in about the same time you want a competitive a competitive ability to compete against people like Hollywood Park or, or uh, haunted, haunted trails and whatnot then too um, I don't want to steal your thunder as far as explanation goes, but did I am I surmising this correct, gentlemen? Is that what you wanted? Okay. And should you get a gaming the opportunity to have the gaming there, you're gonna obviously you have to follow all the rules by the state that you're gonna have a a room that's only accessible. And you were telling me you have like a you know, like a locked door and whatnot yeah. to even get in there. With and and again, ladies and gentlemen, what what these gentlemen were telling me is when you go into Hollywood Park. You got the adults playing their games, and you got the kids playing their games, right? So that's where you're looking for this competitive advantage. Yes, sir. Okay. So, anything else you wanted to add to that and it went while addressing the board this evening? I mean, we we definitely. I know you guys have seen the for sale sign out front. We really don't want to sell the business. However, we're struggling to make ends meet. It is unfortunately it is what it is with the sugar tax that got in, in, enlisted here and. Uh, property taxes getting raised, you know, 30, they raised $30,000, and then liability insurances, labor to, you know, hire employees to help run the place to, you know, mechanics to maintain the go-karts and everything else. In order for us to stay open, you, he's, John's been in also for 20 years, and in order for us to stay open and keep our prices as low as they've been, we have to look for revenue elsewhere and you know, feeling that if we can serve not not nothing strong, obviously we, we're looking for beers, wines, and nothing else. Maybe coffee, and you know, open up like a little restaurant area type of deal where our game room is. It's nothing that we we feel nothing that you know is not doable, not achievable. But just to, for an example, just to update our batting cages, you know, they're a little bit old; they're getting raggedy. Just to update the system, then that is forty thousand dollars. Figure that with the thirty thousand dollar hike in property tax, you know the liability insurance. Ninety six T almost thousand you know the property tax. Right now, next year we're going to propose one hundred fifty. Right, <laughs> and and again, I understand. Always understand, board, and obviously the audience too is we're always looking at different ideas to broaden, diversify incoming re revenue okay where again we would participate nine percent of the take on the and with gaming as well so there is a small benefit on our end of life yet too otherwise we have to rely simply on property taxes that you know well, there's some sales tax where you're at as well but we have to rely on property taxes that we're only we only use we utilize 14 percent of that so I mean as in the last case, you know, if there was a professional office going into something, as opposed to the retail sales tax that are created by liquor sales, again, the, that's, those are monies that we stay away from property taxes with. This takes more off your shoulders as far as the taxpayer is concerned. Same thing with what you're doing here. You know, this isn't going to change our life dramatically on our end, but it, it certainly won't help yours, and the, which is why we had a good conversation the other day. I understand your plight. And that's why it just so happened again because we only have committee meetings once a month like this. I was fortunate to get you into our, our um, 
agenda for this evening, but that's why I wanted you to come and just introduce yourself to the board to, for your, to consider your request as well to participate. And that's, obviously, they need the, the liquor license just to get the gaming, and that's what the state of Illinois does. So any questions from the board? No? Anybody on this side? John, thanks for coming in. Dominic, thank you for coming in. And certainly, I'll stay in touch with you. And um, if we have any more dialogue on this, I'll certainly share it with everybody and so forth then too, okay? And um, I appreciate, you know, the efforts you're making in our community to, to invest in our $10,000 in your business in order to stay alive. I mean, obviously, that's the last effort on your behalf. Certainly, I want you to understand one thing too real quick is should you get everything you're asking for, and, you know, obviously we're going to ask you to take that for sale sign down because you're not going anywhere at that point then, too. But more importantly, should you ever get the itch to do something different in your life, these licenses do not follow you. I, you know, I'm sorry, they, they die with you. Like when you're gone, so is the license and stuff. So anybody coming in is going to start all over again with the same process and the same investment and so forth then, too, okay? All right, just so we don't, I didn't want anybody to think that maybe you were going to offer your place for sale just to enhance somebody else and stuff then too. You're just trying to keep your head above water. Very understood. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Um, one more quickie, and then I'll, I'll get to the 911. Um, gentlemen, I saw you come in at the end. Are you with Yafo? Okay. Would you like to come up, please, and, and explain your position? What is this in regards to? This is on the agenda. This is under um, building. Good evening. And, and I now I, I did see this on our agenda under the building committee. This was item number seven. Uh, this is a presentation. I'm sorry, not not number seven. This was um, oh, it is right here. Presentation number seven. Presentation request a grace period of 365 days to pave your rear lot. Um, for the for the owners of Yafo Auto, located at 12400 Cicero Avenue, uh, in order for Yafo Auto to get their business, uh, they must be in compliance with the building code. We do require a, a paved lot. This is his rear paved lot. You just did your front lot, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. And uh, municipal code states that they must have a parking lot paved prior to getting a business license. So, from what I understand, and I met with with the building inspector earlier today. You guys have done a great job um, Thank you. upgrading everything at that business. I hear what, like a six hundred thousand dollar investment so far? It's it's reached up there so far. Really? Yes. I saw the outside. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't. I don't know your name. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Asher. I'm uh, with Yaffa Auto Services. They're my partners over there. Uh, basically, when we came into the building, uh, we didn't think that it's a total destruction inside the building. I mean, we've seen the walls and everything. Uh, we thought it's not going to be that much of a big deal. But uh, after we started getting more deeper in it, we had to f we had to do the sewers. Uh, it was always uh, like a pool back there, uh, you know, by the dock area. When it rains, it becomes like a, like a water pond. So we had to hire three different sewer companies to come to figure out the problem. We ended up doing all the sewer lines from inside the building all the way into the parking lot. Uh, the uh, side parking lot of the uh, building and the front parking lot has been paved. Uh, we ended up having to redo all the electric inside the building. Uh, we took out all the old electric, ran new electric throughout the whole building into the uh, uh, poles on the uh, side of the building and uh, did a complete renovation of the whole building, basically. Uh, it costed us close to $600,000. And we're at a, you know, we're at a point where... Uh, we're trying to get that extension uh, of 365 days for the rear parking lot, which we have gated. We took out the old gate, of the old fence, and we put a new gate so nobody can actually go inside that lot. And we had an incident where uh, a couple pickup trucks went inside when we were getting the fence redone, started doing uh, spin-arounds in there. So we gated that up and put a lock on it so nobody can uh, get in there also. Uh, the parking lot in the front is completely done. The parking lot on the side is completely done. It's just the uh, back of the uh, building that we're trying to request for an, you know, an extension on. 
Okay. And, and, uh, and I spoke with Roger early, earlier. He's been working with you folks real close. Yes. So you put up, I, I saw the, the, the fence looks great. Did a nice wrought iron fence. It looks very decorative from, from Cicero Avenue. Uh, you upgraded all your electric service. You upgraded your sprinkler system and um, a, a few other things there too, right? Right. Significant. Now, because you're going to be a, an auto body shop and whatnot, now you've got your lifts that you're putting in and all your equipment that you need and so forth. Yes. So what uh, Asher is asking for a board is a professional courtesy to get him at least one year's time where we can attach a rider to your – you don't have a business license from us yet. No, we don't. But when, if, if when we issue this to you, that we'd have a provision in there that if you don't have this done within one year, then we're going to yank the license. Yeah, no, we have we have no problem with that. Uh, we already uh, we already brought a couple different uh, companies uh, contractors to look at the uh, the parking lot. We cleaned it up and uh, and paved it, uh, and and you know got it really uh, paved and ready to to get asphalted. Uh, but we're looking into getting the asphalt sometime around the springtime uh, during the summer area around that period. So. We're asking for the 365 days, but most likely we're going to get it done before the 365 days. Right. Typically, asphalt plants shut down in, in November as it is. So you look, pardon? Mid-October. Exactly. End of October is when it wraps up. So that's why they're asking for a professional courtesy on this. And again, with a rider stipulating board that this is what needs to be done. What will you be using this unpaved lot for? Well, right now, uh, we're not going to be using it uh, for for anything right now. So you won't store any vehicles that are leaking oil or anything on, no. on this lot? No, all the vehicles will be pretty much inside the, uh, the shop. It's a, it's a, the shop is 30,000 30, square feet. Uh, we got plenty of room inside the shop uh, to, uh, to store vehicles. Uh, we're not, you know, I, I, I understand the uh, previous people, the previous tenants and the owner that was over there after looking into everything that was going on inside this property, I understand they, they uh, pretty much terrorized everybody that's living They weren't over. good neighbors, we'll say they, that. They were not. <laughs> and uh, we're not going to have that same experience. We're, uh, they were using it for parting up vehicles and, and, uh, and, and you know, throwing the, dumping the oil where the oil was going into the neighbors. We, we, we uh, uh, repaved the area and uh, made it a little bit higher from the neighbor's area uh, side, you know, so that when it rains or anything, the water goes into the sewers where it doesn't even leak into the neighbor's uh, houses. Um, we're going to also be, you know, upgrading the fences back there as well down the line to make it look a little bit more uh, decorative. Uh, if you pass by Cicero Avenue, which I know everybody passes over there every night, we uh, got it lit as much as we you could. You can't miss it. I, I didn't know. <laughs> I, I live I live over there behind there. In the first night I saw, I said, "What the heck is that?" You know, you you definitely have it lit up. Yeah, we're 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 trying we're trying to upgrade it as much as as we could and. Uh, you know, I, I, I wish I would have been. I, I wish I would have had enough time to download everything on a USB drive to show you guys before and after uh, of the property, which which I have pictures of, and I, I know uh, Roger has pictures of the property before and after as well. Uh, it was a total destruction, and uh, the uh, it, it was unbelievable how how it looked. And every time I walk in there after we finished everything, you know, I tap myself on my shoulders, and, you know, <laughs> for for the work that we've done on it. Um, I mean, we're not going to be using it for any kind of uh, uh, parking. Any, uh, I mean, you know, being a being a mechanic shop, most of the cars are going to be parked inside, uh, inside the shop. Uh, for for body shop, uh, uh, you know, for the body shop, you also have the uh, section of the body shop which is divided inside the shop. The body shop is inside, and the mechanic shop is inside as well. Uh, now, if we have to, uh, after we get it asphalted use some of that section over there where we're going to divide it pretty much. There's going to be a fence from the, uh, from the uh, south part of that building. There's a, there's a concrete ramp that we built that we, uh, we uh, ended up doing. We're going to be putting a fence by that concrete ramp over there to fence it out, to s divide it from the other part of the lot so that we can use that section where if we have to put any of the cars that, that have body work on the asphalted part, 
after it gets asphalted, you know, then we can, you know, use it. But it's not going to be anywhere near the neighbors. Uh, there's not going to be any kind of hazardous leaks or anything like that, uh, that that's going to leak into the uh, neighbors' houses. As a matter of fact, the fence areas, uh, when we get the asphalt done, we're going to, prior to doing the asphalt, we're going to end up changing the fence, whatever is ours over there and whatever is not ours. There's, there's a neighbor who was frustrated with the old owners uh, because one of their fences is knocked down, which is on the north side of the, uh, of the, of the yard. Uh, we have some people that came and looked at it. We're going to end up fixing it for him as a courtesy, you know, so that he can have his privacy that he needs. And down the line, we're going to get a much better fence between us and the neighbors or gate or, you know, something that's going to be sure that there's no hazardous materials that's going to leak into uh, the neighbor's uh, properties at all. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, a shop, not a chop shop. Okay. Very good. Trustees, any questions uh, for Asher right now? Is the 365 days an economical reason, or is it just because you're asking for an entire year and the asphalt shops close very soon now? So what you're what you're looking for, and I know that you had said that you you look to do this in the early summer. Yeah, so we're looking to start with it sometime around spring, when when the asphalt uh, season comes in, where we're allowed to do asphalt when the when the snow and the freezing temperatures go away. Yeah. That's when we're going to look into uh, getting the asphalt done. So we're we're asking for the 365 days, but it's going to be a lot less than 365 days. I guess I'd feel more comfortable looking at a, a six or a nine month extension of it, and then if for whatever reason you need it some more time, then certainly we might be able to accommodate that. But to to say one year and then all of a sudden have that fall off to a, yet another season is a little bit more difficult because one year comes to where the asphalt plants close. Yes. No, I I, I have no problem with that at all. Anybody over here? Okay. Yeah, sure. I appreciate your request. Uh, I mean, it's it's a fair one, especially with how much money you've had to put into the business. Um, obviously, building department does a great job overseeing this and make sure folks are up to code as they should be. But not everybody has to incur what you did. We know that between that building, you know, it had a collapsed roof at some point. Yes. Uh, we were trying to establish different programs over there that good, bad, or indifferent didn't have to take off because folks like yourself reinvested in our community and stuff then too. So. And we've got some. We've got a um, planned zoning hearing for October 25th for the property to the south of you then too. So we're expecting good things from that property as well then too. So um, again, thanks for coming in. And I'll ask. Uh, you're under the um, you're under the bu the building committee here. So I'll ask Trustee Zelensky to follow up with you so, so we can go for approval, uh, Trustee, at the next meeting for that, and, and see if we can approve that for you then too. We, we meet next. This is just committee. We vote, we vote at board meetings. Next week is a board meeting instead, okay? Uh, Thank you very much. Asher, can you please Sign sign in for the clerk, please? Yeah. Thank you. That you addressed us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, could we just clarify then? Would it be six or nine months? Sure. I recommend going with 270 just in case there's bad weather in the spring. And nine. 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 270 days, trustee, is what, what they're looking at. Um, lastly, and then we'll go to the 911 uh, presentation. I didn't see anybody else in the audience that had to address us uh, except for uh, possibly a public forum. Uh, would anyone in the audience wish to address the board and anything on our agenda this evening? No, no one? No love and play. Pardon? Oh, um, love to play had to cancel. I'm sorry, I got that call about an hour ago. Uh, they had a situation that they couldn't rectify right now, and um, which uh, which call it the um, we had uh, Red Roof. Red Roof is. Uh, I spoke to him uh, about an hour, two hours ago. He is stuck in Michigan in traffic, so I told him we'll, we'll schedule him for the next committee meeting next month. Then we'll speak with him. Nobody from the, uh, the village? Would you like to address the board, ma'am? Okay, no problem. I was single, yeah, I just want to ask, that's all, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pardon me? No. Or later. Oh, you can talk to the board right now if you want to make a statement, sure.
Um, I'm just here to um, express my disapproval of adding more liquor license for the purpose um, of also adding more video gambling. There are currently two video gambling cafes, one on Pulaski and one on Cicero already. There are approximately 10 more businesses that have gambling machines. How many more do we need? The Zillux budget soon will be the red roof in that wants a liquor license. This is a motel with a notorious reputation. While I appreciate that the Red Roof Inn is coming in here with a new owner, I'm happy that the neighborhood is finally rid of Dale Lux. I, at this point, have no proof that the Red Roof Inn will be a good neighbor. Why are we so willing to grant them a liquor license? We need to see that they are willing to make a difference and keep decent standards. I don't understand as, as there is no restaurant or bar there, so I don't understand their intentions with a liquor license and gambling. Um, the Fun Times Square application is reckless. Fun Times Square is a family-themed business, one of the only in Alsip. Um, my children have enjoyed time there. I can't believe that anyone would think it's a good idea to serve liquor at a place that has high-speed batting cages, a paintball field, and go-karts. Who's going to stop somebody that has alcohol in their system from participating in the attractions? The teenage kids working there? They simply can go across the street to South Sides where there is already alcohol and video gambling. And the location at 116th and Pulaski, a liquor store, why? This is across the street from the Worth Township that offers, among other things, on their website, Lego Club, game nights, babysitting classes, playtime, story time, chess club, summer camp. These activities are offered year-round for ages 3 to 12. You want a place to buy liquor? It's on Plasky already. You can find two liquor stores already on Plasky, plus you can get it at Jewel, Aldi, Food for Less, and Walgreens. I realize that the village is looking for revenue streams. Do not compromise our great village with reckless decisions that will drive the residents elsewhere to spend their hard-earned money. I, for one, would never consider setting foot in a video gambling cafe. These liquor licenses will not better the village and are not ideal for our community. We need businesses that we will want to frequent, not another eyesore that preys on disadvantaged people. I think the village of Alsip can do better, and the residents of Alsip deserve better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you sign in for her as well, too, please? Thank you. Okay. Um, moving along. Uh, can we please, uh, we're going to have a presentation here by our 911 uh, consolidation expert on this. Uh, Diana, are you available? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had talk, many talks recently, and we currently are in the middle of negotiations to consolidate our 911 dispatch. Uh, per the state of Illinois, we have less than 25,000 residents, so the village of Elsup was uh, basically forced to consolidate our 911 dispatch with a another community uh, that could facilitate this. Um, it was the recommendation of the 911 committee to uh, bring our service to the Oak Lawn dispatch. And uh, Diana is here this evening from Oak Lawn dispatch. Uh, Diana, what's the, is there a, an official name with, with your dispatch organization as well? It's the Oak Lawn Regional Emergency Communications. Thank you. Um, trustees, uh, everyone was given a packet on 911 consolidation. Um, our trustee Mike Kankar surmised a letter on the um, on the front page of the packet that I put in everybody's <laughs> mailbox. Did everybody get that? You mean our attorney? Pardon? Our attorney. Our attorney. You said our trust, trustee. trustee Kankar. I apologize. Our our village attorney Mike Kankar. So anyway, there was about a 45 page packet that I had put in everyone's mailbox here and uh, just the front cover or I'm sorry the letter that we received from our village attorney uh, basically says that uh, to the mayor and board of trustees he enclosed ordinances uh, and related documents relating to the 911 consolidation the following is a brief description of the documents uh, what he put in here was an ordinance authorizing the execution of an intergovernmental agreement with the village of Alsip, I'm sorry, with the village of Oak Lawn. The ordinance authorizes the execution of an intergovernmental agreement between the village of Alsip and the village of Oak Lawn relating to dispatch services. 
The agreement itself is attached to the ordinance. The intergovernmental, intergovernmental agreement is identified, is identical rather, to Oak Lawn's agreements with Burbank, Bridgeview, Evergreen Park, and Hodgkins, i.e. including Oak Lawn as well, the other Tier 1 users. The village's contributions to the operations of Dispatch Center are spelled out in Sections 6 and 7 of the Intergovernmental Agreement. The tier 1 users' contributions are based upon each participant's calls for service, population, and equalized assessed valuation. Note that Section 6.1 provides that the, that the Tier 1 users have a meaningful participation in the, budget, in the budget process is a tier one user with the largest piece of pie is Oak Lawn. Oak, I'm sorry, with the largest, is a tier one user with the largest piece of the budget pie. Oak Lawn has an ample incentive to make sure that the dispatch center runs efficiently and economically. What he put in here, trustees, is he's got a weighted model comparison this document is for informational purposes only, based upon the weighted average formula. The village would have contributed 14.79% of the Tier 1 user's share of the operational budget. Uh, it had been a participant in the Oaklawn Regional Emergency Communications Center, which is what Diane just explained, for a period covering July 2016 through June 2017. On page two, he's got the ordinance authorizing the village's membership. Uh, all tier one users are members of the uh, Joint Emergency Telephone Systems Board. The village will become a member of the, sorry, Diane, it, it's got such a long title to it. OLREC. All right, we'll just stay with the OLREC. OLREC. Uh, once the consolidation is approved by the Illinois statewide 911 administrator, the anticipated approval date is April or May of 2018. The intergovernmental agreement authorizing the village's membership in OLREC is attached to the ordinance. OLREC's bylaws are in here as well. All members of OLREC, the Tier 1 users, are governed by the enclosed bylaws. The bylaws are not approved by the village. I have enclosed this document for informational purposes only, per Michael Kankar. And lastly is the ordinance suspending the operations of the village's ETSB. As required by law, the operations of the village's ETSB will be suspended once the Illinois statewide 911 administrator approves the consolidation, which is, that is, the village's membership in OLREC. When this occurs, the 911 related surcharge funds previously received by the village's ETSB will be routed to OLREC. And then certainly, um, Attorney Kane Carpenter, if you have any questions, contact him. Currently, we, we receive close to what, $200,000 from the state for a 911 dis, uh, dispatch? Kent, maybe you'd be best to answer that. I believe, I believe, I've been at the meeting, I believe it was $192,000, something like that, right around there. It's right around 200. Uh, it's going to be going, not that it's coming here. Not that it's coming here, but it is going to be increasing uh, in, in terms of the revenues coming in. We're one of the few who will increase um, in terms of revenue with that new law. Okay. Not that it's coming here. We, we get credit for it. It's, uh, you know, it. It doesn't, your money doesn't wind up in OLREC. Your board votes on the monies that we receive. Um, it's based on, it, it, the, the, when we get the payments that come in, you can see which village is contributing what from surcharge money, and then your representative on that board will then say, okay, go ahead and, and move that money to pay for operational costs. So it's offsetting the operational and maintenance costs of the center. So the money that we get from the state doesn't go to OLREC. So basically what happens is we have this piece of the pie, 14.1%, is that what they said? So basically whatever your budget is every year along with increases, 14.1% of it is ours. We get our funding from the state and then we write a check for 14.1%, right? Right. I mean, you'll get the, the funding will get funneled into OLREC, but whoever sits on your board, whatever representative you have on that board, will say go ahead and move our surcharge money to offset that. Now, if you 
want to say otherwise and say, well, you're just going to take our surcharge and you're still going to pay into the operational. So you're taking it off the top of the operational and the, um, the maintenance agreement. I, I think the trustee's peers question, I don't think it ever comes directly here anymore. I no, it, it won't. And that's by the state. So by the state consolidated, um, when they have you consolidate, that check will come to us. It's going to come to the Oakland Regional Center. But, but we have it, it's identified yet. Yeah, we have that what we do with all the rest of the agencies too. You can see everybody, you know, it's labeled Evergreen, it's labeled Burbank, so you could tell exactly what's coming in from the state for your surcharge. So that that amount doesn't pay for fourteen point one. It offsets it. Absolutely. 100%. There's no yeah, right. You can take it all and we that's what we do all the time with it. So no no no, but my, my point is not Oh, not cover the whole our cost of it, no. So right. But so your surcharge is also and that's kind of what Kent explained, it's currently, if I'm not mistaken, it's like eighty seven cents um, that we're receiving. Everyone is currently from the state. Um, and effective in January I think we were just the discussion was that we wouldn't really see it till May because of the state, you know, paying out behind. Um, it went up to a dollar five. So that will increase, and you'll will see more revenue coming in to help offset those costs. A dollar fifty. Is a dollar fifty? Right. And, and I've since looked up the number you were referring to in the budget for this year. It's one hundred sixty-seven thousand three hundred two dollars. Okay. So is it the, as far as the the towns that are in this? Um, and, and I think this might have been answered before, but it's equal representation, or do we have a fourteen point one percent weighted vote on? Budgeting and you know, I mean our representation. No, we have um, all the every tier one person that comes in, which means that we're taking your 911 calls, we're dispatching your police and fire. You have one vote. So each agency that's a tier one has one vote. So we have one voting member on each on that on that committee on the joint 911 authority, and then we also have an operationals board, which um, you can bring. I mean, wh whoever wants to to participate in that, there's only one vote for each agency, though. Okay. I think that was answered before. I just was in my head to ask it again. Oh, no. That's all right. Thanks. Diana, I believe your agency has said as well that you're going to monitor our the fire uh, alarm calls as well then, too? Correct. The Caltron, and, yes. And, and Exactly. It, there was no additional cost for any of that? No, it's not. Um, because we. it doesn't matter how we receive your call, whether you're calling... 911 to say, hey, the fire alarm's going off, or the neighbor's calling, or the resident. If we get it on the alarm board, or if we get it via phone, or or somebody walking in, it doesn't make a difference. We'd be double charging it if we if we had to do it two both ways. Right. Um, I, you allow me. Sure. Really ahead, quick Ken. thing. There is four uh, agenda items here. There really should be three. Number three is actually a summary of four, five, and six. So I just wanted to, there's three ordinances that would be coming to a vote um, at next Monday's meeting. Um, and this keeps us on the same timetable, part of our negotiations. Actually, it wasn't in the nitty gritty because these are, um, these are pretty much, as, as uh, the attorney stated, standardized. Um, it's more about things like timing, how does all of this work, how do we get the proper infrastructure in, what's the timing with the, if it, I mean, with, with, <laughs> with the 911 admi state admi um, administrator, how, do, how does all of this work with personnel? Um, this is the stuff that we've been going through, and uh, we have a timetable. Hopefully, we're looking at uh, right around the end of the fiscal year, but most of that is not um, going to be in our hands, keeping these ordinances um, moving along fits into that timetable, but the state and AT&T are really uh, after that uh, one followed by the other are really going to be the ones that are driving the timetable. We're just crossing our fingers and making sure that um, the stuff that's in our court, we continue to move along with that timetable. So once we once we put these ordinances in place, when do we hear? What, when do well, we get back from you? What's the next tip, step? Uh, and Diana can address that further. The state has been taking their time. However, we're one of the uh, last players standing. They've got their system down. We're crossing our fingers by the end of the calendar year, right around there. It could be a little bit more. It could be a little bit less. Um, but if we pass this uh, at the next board meeting, that's, that's our hopeful timetable. 
um, that we would be looking at. There's uh, one more point I want to state, which is that the 911 board has uh, ceded any potential um, control or operations on this, as we've stated before, to the village board so as not to confuse who has uh, decision-making authority. Should the board look like they're going to uh, move along with this, the 911 board uh, intends to meet next Friday, um, or actually say this Friday, um, to pass the same uh, agreement. <laughs> they're not, they don't have the right to pass uh, ordinances, but to say, look, we're in the favor of the, these three agreements, um, and so there won't ever be any um, ambiguity about whether or not this was a unified decision, but it's based upon what the village board intends. And, and again, board, obviously our village attorneys have reviewed these contracts and uh, don't see anything improper about the, the offer or the agreement, more, more importantly, that you have here then too. As Ken said, these are pretty much the same standard contract that Evergreen, Burbank, Elk Lawn, Hodgkins, everyone's approved the same contract. Nobody has any advantage over the other. They don't. They're all the same. And in our meetings, they've been very amicable. I mean, this, the, uh, to call them negotiations is actually too strong of a word. It implies that there's some sort of argument here. Um, it really was just a matter of logistics, and they've been uh, very good. Uh, Oak Lawn has been very good in this whole process. I want to thank them. Trustees, any questions? This side? No. So we'll have three ordinances, the, all three, just four, five, and six. There's three ordinances. Um, that one that uh, the mayor referred to, there's two other things in the packet. One was the bylaws, because you should know that. It's good background information. The other was um, Diana had uh, their team put together a projected, based on the numbers that we gave and the numbers that they have, what would it, what would it have looked like? What kind of percentage? Um, as Chief Miller has said, the calls for service may be low, um, so that may go up a little bit. There's, and Diana can uh, address this if I'm saying this wrong, but um, their system has four different methodologies for how you can uh, come up with the allocation of who pays what, and it's an average of those four different systems. Um, but that's very clearly seen in the, the version that has ALSIP in there as a column. Um, so if you think about calls for service going up a bit, um, you can see how it will impact the others if that number turns out to be a little bit low uh, based on what Chief Miller said in a previous meeting. Okay. Thank you. It won't, be, it won't be largely material, but it, it would sneak up a bit from there. Thank you. So again, we're, we're approving three ordinances here. This will be an ordinance suspending the operations of the village of ALSIP Emergency Telephone System Board. The next would be the um, right ordinance. An ordinance of the Village of Elsip authorizing the execution of an intergovernmental agreement allowing for the Village of Elsip's membership and participation in the Oakland Regional Emergency Communications Joint 911 Authority. And the last one, Chief, we, I had in here too was the um, intergovernmental agreement for the specific dispatch services. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. The ordinance of the Village of Elsip authorizing the execution of an intergovernmental agreement with the Village of Oakland to provide emergency dispatch services. So that would be it. So we'll ask that uh, we put this on the agenda next week at a board agenda for, for approval on that then too, should there be an agreement with that. All right. Can I say one thing? Absolutely. I, I just wanted to follow up on the, the timeline for Trustee Pierce too. Um, once these agreements are, the ordinances are passed, um, it'll be up to me to get a to hold of AT&T to, to finalize our consolidation plan, and my goal is to submit that by the end of this month. Uh, they do have up to 90 days to return because it has to go through the administrative law judge hearing. They do a technical review, 
It goes through administrative law judge hearing. It goes in front of the 911 advisory committee, and then it finally goes to the 911 administrator. And each of those entities have, if I'm not mistaken, 20 to 30 days to, to review and turn that time around. So we could potentially be looking at you know anywhere between 60 to 90 days after that submittal is made. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Diane. Diane, for the record, too, how do you say your last name again? Is it Tris Trisant? Tusanat. Tusanat, sorry. Thank you very much. It, and you, that everyone, no one pronounces Tusanat. it. Tusanat. So I, I right. say it up multiple different ways. So. Great. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Tusanat, there, too. So you spoke thank with you. us today. Thanks. Okay, moving along on our agendas, uh, we'll hear from the clerk, clerk's report. I have the presentation for the minutes of the July 17, 2017, Committee of the Whole Meeting. Also, the presentation of the minutes of the July 18, 2017, Committee of the Whole Meeting. The presentation of the FOIA report for September 2017. And then two um, motor fuel tax presentations. Presentation of the IDOT motor fuel tax allotment for August 2017 in the amount of $1,147,075.75. And the presentation of the IDOT motor fuel tax allotment for September 2017 in the amount of $1,184,278.48. Um, I am also pleased to let everyone know that we did extend an offer for the full-time deputy collector position to Tiffany, and she has accepted, so I have um, a paper here to complete that. And that is all I have, Mayor Ryan. Very good. Standing Committee's Finance Committee, Trustee McLaurin. I guess I'm going to turn it over to Kent because he hasn't said enough yet tonight. <laughs> um, hopefully this, this starts to conclude my part. Um, the, the TIF 1, uh, there's a 23-year period for a tax increment financing district. TIF 1 has run its course. It ran its course. The state statutes is um, very murky. And the end of a TIF is the date is a, a little difficult. Um, it doesn't have a clean definition, but essentially, um, it ran its course at December 31st of last year. In preparation of that, the prior village board uh, did two things. One, it passed something stating that that was the end of the um, the end of the TIF, and the second was it tried to figure out what to do with the monies that had been accumulated in that TIF. It decided that there was a uh, resurf a number of projects came forward and the one project that made it through the board was the resurfacing of the Deer Creek and the Arbor Glen subdivision because the roads were deteriorating and with um, that it was actually the monies came from that uh, TIF 1 that was in TIF 1 so it's putting it back towards um, some of the people who helped contribute towards those monies. Uh, that project is, became part of a plan that I created with uh, Mary Thompson from Kane McKenna that we presented before the village board. That plan was approved by the village board. It essentially said pay for Deer Creek Arbor Glen. Um, then uh, as soon as the last bill has been paid and Technically, it hasn't been paid, but we now know what that bill is. We just got the last bill. So this is because we have a committee meeting once a month. I decided we should rush it in. We know the exact dollar amount. Um, what would be left would be $600,000. The reason that there would be $600,000 is not that there would ever be money that can be spent from that TIF. It can't. The reason for it has to do with property tax appeals. And property tax appeals can come in one of two ways. The regular one is the Property Tax Appeal Board, which is referred to as PTAB. The other way uh, that also works is through the circuit court. Property tax appeals can come many years later after property taxes have been paid, and it can be a refund. It has always been assumed that if a TIF dissolves, that when they come back uh, in a property tax appeal, that the county would take it from the municipality, even though the municipality is a very small portion of your property tax, because the municipality was the one who was overseeing the TIF, um, and not from the school districts who are the majority of where the money is from. 
That was reaffirmed last year in a court case um, where exactly that happened. A municipality refunded the rest of the monies. There was prop very large property tax appeals. The county came after the uh, municipality. The municipality filed suit saying it shouldn't go to us. It should go where the money was distributed from with the surplus. And the municipality lost that case. So what um, the prudent person would do um, now is essentially a requirement, which is you have to have enough money to uh, cover uh, property tax appeals. So Mary and I looked very closely at the property tax appeals that had been there. We're very conservative and said after the resurfacing project, we want $600,000 left in there for the first year, um, and we would uh, refund as a surplus any additional monies. In the next five subsequent years, we would look. I would look at the um, amount of property tax appeals, and if there is nothing in terms of property tax appeals, I would bring forth before the board each year another $100,000 of um, refunds. Is the intent? The board can change that based on circumstances and based on my recommendation. Um, but if there weren't any property tax appeals, the idea would be 100000 of that 600000 for the first five years. That last $100,000 would be for five more years beyond that. Because, again, property tax appeals can be, come from a long, long time ago. Um, and there are some large industrial pieces of property on there. It changes hands, et cetera. Somebody could file. So this was a, a balance between getting the monies back to the taxing bodies and protecting the village who unfortunately would be left holding the bag if there was a property tax appeal. So we are intending to go with what the village passed on that. Um, again, it's a tiny bit early because it, it was based on bills being paid, but we know what they're going to be. Um, the, the resurfacing project came in. We, we budgeted, uh, uh, Will and Mike and I budgeted very conservatively on how much that the project would cost. Um, it came in, not just the conservative part of it, but it came in way under budget. Um, and so that amount of money we had conservatively said was going to be $600,000 for that you would be, um, sur be funding as a surplus. It's actually going to be, I think, what, 603000 and some change. Um, and, six, and so uh, that is what I'm going to bring forth um, before the board next Monday um, is a refund of TIF-1 surplus. And again, that will leave 600000 in with the intent if there's, um, of up to $100,000 a year for each of the next five years and one last $100,000 um, 10 years. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kent. Um, um, and, uh, there, it's actually listed as two items. Uh, it shouldn't have been listed as the second one. That's what we ta titled it last year. Mm -hmm. um, so they, it was in the packet, and I think they just saw it in the packet, the title, and put that on there too. Okay. In addition to the TIF, um, next week for the board meeting, I will also have the usual payroll and list of bills. That's all I have under finance. Very good. Uh, Fire Committee Trustee McLaughlin. Fire, um, other than the open house was this past Saturday. I have nothing at this time. Open house was a success. Uh, full house, and um, the kids enjoyed the side-by-side -side burn, as well as the um, Superior Ambulance helicopter came out, too, and that was great. So good show out there. Uh, Police Committee, Trustee McGrill. I'll have a list of bills and timesheets for approval and the September monthly report. And the 911 consolidation has been already discussed under the mayor's report. Is there anything else that you want to add, Chief Miller? I just want to make sure everyone had a chance to ask their questions. Are there any other questions on it? Can I ask um, what the status of the dispatch staff is? Are they getting positions over there? Or how's that going? Obviously, we have to 
still be in our center for mm -hmm. some time. So, but they've been um, seeing the staff and okay. progressing for the next month. One dispatcher is currently working over that part of it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Next, the uh, Public Work Committee, Trustee Juarez is absent. Committee? On behalf of Trustee Juarez, uh, she will have a list of bills, timesheets, and a presentation to request for approval to purchase four new overhead garage motor operators in total amount of $11,088. Mike, this is like the second year we've asked for these, right? <laughs> Mike. Uh, next building committee, Trustee Zelensky. Yes, Mayor. I got a list of bills and timesheets. Uh, also, a monthly report for September 2017. I have a request for a temporary ground signs for the Alsip Chamber of Commerce for their craft show on October 21st, 2017, and their chamber auction on October 10th, 2017. We have a request for uh, temporary flags and pendants from Checkers Restaurant located at 11915 South Pulaski Road. Do we have a date range on that? In the letter, it said 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, they're 30 days. Um, also, I'd like to get a consensus uh, from the board for that approval. Everybody okay? Okay, thanks. Everybody okay with that? Okay, and then I'd like to defer to the mayor. Uh, would you like to add something from legal on this? I, I did discuss um, the idea uh, prior with the approving uh, flags and so forth signs and um, he did say that it can be basically an administrative task where if you've got the approval of your building commissioner the mayor can sign off on those rather than making people wait weeks for a, a board meeting for that to happen we can do that administratively in-house and building department is responsible for that then too at the same time in this case uh, especially to help promote his new business out there the checkers restaurant sometimes you don't want to put those flags out too early before you open tomorrow is opening day uh, is there official opening day at the Checkers restaurant? You put those out early, everybody's coming to your door and you can't facilitate anybody. So uh, this is why we're asking for a consensus this evening because we don't meet again for another week. And he wants to get those out there right now. So, okay. We also had this come up last time. We had uh, a business wanting to put up flags. Uh, we had discussed that uh, it would no longer probably go through the board because it wasn't necessary that the building department uh, inspector would actually go and approve it. Exactly. That's what I was saying. The building department take responsibility for that with the, with the mayor's approval. Okay. We also have a request uh, for Stony Creek School to have a vendor fair on December 2nd, 2017. Uh, a presentation to request a grace period of 365 days, which we reduced to 270 days. Uh, to pave the rear parking lot from the owner of Yafo Auto, located at 12400 South Cicero Avenue. In order for Yafo Auto to get their business uh, license, they must be in compliance with all building codes. Municipal Code Section 17-9 states that they must have the parking lot paved prior to getting this business license. Are you going to add uh, the stipulation for pulling the license if they aren't compliant after 270 days? Sure. Okay. And also uh, a request for a block party for the residents at 12242 South Lawndale Avenue on Saturday, October 21st, 2017 from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. midnight. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, next, Water and Sewer, Trustee Tozal. Presentation list of bills and the employee time records. That's all I have. Thank you. Next, License Committee, Trustee Juarez, go to committee. I'll fill in for Trustee Juarez. Um, we'll have a presentation of a request for a refund to Coin Laundromat for 15 unused vending stickers at $10 each for a total of $150. Also, a presentation for a business license refund for Brainay's Gourmet Apples in the amount of $40. The owner was in, unable to obtain insurance. And... 
Um, we also have listed a discussion to increase the gaming license fees. This would be based on Trustee Zielinski's information from last week. Just wanted to make sure, too, uh, Mayor, on that, uh, that everybody did receive a comparison for all the area areas around, you know, the perimeter of Alsip and, and a little bit farther out that uh, what we were asking to raise those rates to would be comparable to at least a dozen different different municipalities. So, um, Trustee, are you going to go with it? Let's put it this way. Are you going to have this on the agenda next week? I will. Okay. So because it doesn't discuss anything. That's the number. Number-wise, number. uh, yeah. cost-wise, on the agenda this evening. So currently, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a $25 fee per video gaming license uh, for all existing machines. We've got currently 60 machines in the village of Alsub. So there are 12 establishments that have five machines each. And the trustee is proposing to raise that number from $25 per machine to $500 per machine. And um, certainly the village is able to adjust these should the board decide to approve this measure. But I just want to be clear, trustee, that's that's your request to, to have that done, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that number. If you're asking for a consensus. Well, just yeah. for the uh, benefit of comparison. the people out there that don't see the comparison, uh, we've gone through uh, different communities uh, as, for example, Cicero is asking for 1500 per machine, Berwyn 1000 a machine, Tinley Park 1000 a machine, Stickney 500, Calumet Park 500, Markham, Midlothian, Oaklawn, Chicago Ridge are all at 500. Oak Forest is 500, and Elk Grove Village is a $1,000 flat fee for up to five machines as well. So I think 500 is is. Uh, and, and just so everybody knows too, the typical uh, the tip, the state statute actually uh, that been approved for video gaming through the state of Illinois for we, we're a home rule community, so we can adjust these costs as we see fit. Uh, for a non-home rule community. The state regulates that at $25. So while we're at $500 per machine, Crestwood's at $25 per machine. So just so you see, there, there is an active difference between, and hopefully um, our businesses are willing to comply with this. Otherwise, they're not going to get a license. So uh, re re just, license renewal, I believe, is April 30th when I read up on this on, too. Okay. Right. And just to be clear, too, uh, the people that actually own the games – reimburse the businesses 50% of the fee that they are charged from the village. So it's technically not $2,500 for the five machines. It'll actually only be $1,250 for the business to incur. So what's the procedure? Do we approve increasing the license, or do we actually have to write an ordinance for next Monday night's meeting? We'll need an ordinance to make the adjustment. Right. So Can I ask a Absolutely. Yes. 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 And certainly, if with board consensus on that number, uh, that we can um, to give direction to the attorney to draft an ordinance to approve that. Okay. Every, a, my thoughts on it would be that yes, you know, April 30th or May 1st when the new fees go in, but any any new ones from this point on or from the date of the ordinance would be at the new fee. Well, the, the present license is has an effective date. So right, that is what I'm saying. Anybody who currently has a license is not going to be impacted by right. this until their renewal. Until it's renewal April right. by April 30th, yes. But if we were to grant a liquor license or a person who already has a liquor license applied for this at that point in time, they'd have to purchase it at that new rate. It's new. I just wanted to make that clear. Right. Thank you, Trustee. Uh, next, economic development, Trustee. Pe oh, I'm sorry. Can I go, go back ahead. for a sec. I apologize. Yeah. Um, the two previous items, um, the, the request for refund. Since we were talking earlier about the fact we were, had been cleaning up some of the process to make the meetings go smoother, I thought um, those were the types of things that the ref small dollar refunds we were taking out of the agenda. Kent, you're exactly right. We did have direction from our village attorney before too that that. Rather than having the board vote on 
uh, refunding, let's just say ten dollar, twenty dollar items, that can be an administrative task as well, just to streamline our meetings a little bit. Okay, so. and, that, and that also helps because that the people who have overpaid, um, if it's a small dollar amount, and it, it it gets them their money back. Sure, they're not waiting weeks at a time for us to okay something. I think that makes a lot of sense, but I think you should also notify the board so that we know. We can send a That's note. That's fine. Sure. Uh, uh, Put it in a committee meeting, mm -hmm. but not on the... Uh, right. That's fine. Economic Development, Trustee Pierce. Uh, we had earlier the presentation, of course, by John Bovary. Um, also, we have the monthly report for September. Uh, Roger is here, if anyone has any questions. Sorry, Roger. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Next, Planning and Zoning, Trustee Zielinski. Uh, no report tonight. I spoke to the trustee before the meeting as well, and I did identify someone to act as a secretary to the Planning and Zoning Committee, and um, I'll be speaking with um, the Finance Department tomorrow just to confirm um, what the hourly cost is for that service. I know we all, we, we appropriate like $1,000 uh, to cover it all year long. I thought you said 1080 It was 1080 yeah. But I want to double check the you know what the hourly rate is on that as, as well too for service. Like I stated to you uh, earlier in previous years, uh, that would have been well over, or we would have been well under budget for those. But uh, with all the things that we've got going on, exactly, we've been busy here, and there's a lot of special use uh, zoning commitments coming up yet too. Special committee reports, village properties, Trustee McGlohorn. Um I have correspondence from Roger Early that I would like to read for the record. Um, dated October 9th. I have had several of the seniors that attended the coffee with a copy event last week at the Heritage Complexes is, express their gratitude for the ALSA Police Department. They were very grateful for the Police Department taking the time out of their demanding schedules to host the event for them. I would like to thank Chief Miller, Deputy Chief Schultz, Lieutenant Mykos, Lieutenant Gutkowski, and Officer Merlot, and the Investigations Officer Delir. If there are any questions, please contact me. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Good event, too, Chief. And that's all I have. Okay. Next, uh, trust uh, Insurance Committee, Trustee McGrill. Um, I, we have, can have some discussion regarding whether to request a competitive sealed bid for the village's benefits coverage, which would include the health, dental, vision, life, and AD&D, &D, which is um, <coughs> accidental death and dismemberment, and STD and LTD, short-term and long-term disability. Um, this coverage has a renewal date of January 1st, 2018, and the suggested deadline for bids would be November 30th, 2017. Appropriate SBCs, which is Summary of Benefits and Coverage, are attached. Um, they were de this, uh, provided by HR to the board. Specific census information is available through HR for those who are authorized to re request and receive the information as part of the bidding process. So I I'd like to turn this over to Kathy from HR to kind of give us more of a background on this. Okay, so just for clarification purposes. Uh, excuse me, Kathy, can you want to say we are recording this because folks always ask at home. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just for clarification purposes, brokers cannot, um, they can't cross quote. And what that means is our current broker retains our coverage with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Another broker cannot go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and request a quote. They'd be quoting against themselves, basically. So what we're looking at, if we want to proceed with this, would be another carrier that would come in and quote out the coverage, excluding the Blue Cross coverage. So it would be somebody else not necessarily Blue Cross that would come in and provide a quote for coverage. And on the document that you all received, it was a letter. Um, there are some very specific requirements that are currently written in our contracts that we cannot uh, ignore as part of uh, an outside quote. Um, specifics about prescription coverage specifics about what is considered a covered item and probably most importantly specifics about what type of coverage is required, a health reimbursement account, and what those 
um, in network uh, physicians and providers would look like. So there are some pretty tough parameters, not impossible, but I want to make sure that we're clear about um, the coverage itself. We currently have Blue Cross. No other broker could come in and quote with them. That would be a standing coverage. So uh, somebody else would only be able to bring us quotations of coverage from other potential vendors outside of Blue Cross. Trustees, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Would that, how would that impact like contracts and things that are in place? I mean, well, I don't uh, the, know. The current, co the current contracts don't name Blue Cross specifically. Okay. But again, in that cover letter, there were some um, bullet points that gave you an idea of how, uh, you know, the parameters would need to be followed. And probably, again, the most specific one would be um, the network that's available and the HRA. So those two would be uh, probably the most uh, difficult uh, for a company. Now, let's keep something else in mind. We're self-insured. So if you know, ABC company quotes and we find that there are providers that aren't in their network, we are able to say put that physician in our network because we're self-funded. We, we pay those, you know, bills basically. Um, but that would probably affect premium. So I, I know you'd like to do this to be more cost effective, but I don't see how it's more cost effective with the time period that we have and the services that we're receiving right now, but I don't know how anyone else feels. Well, two things come into, into play. The reason I, I've, I've been insisting on, on this for the last month and a half or two months was I wanted to get, be competitive. I want to basically, it's, it's our job, not only to keep our own costs down for services, but to look out for the interests of the taxpayer. The taxpayer is picking up 85% of the cost of that insurance for village health care insurance for both active and retired employees. That said, this is the one time of the year that we have an opportunity to look at these programs before we renew and see if we can save money. Now, initially, like anybody else, I want to run right out, like as you do in your own house, and you'll call three or four companies to compare numbers. But unfortunately, when it comes to, we have a lot of collecting bargaining agreements here with regard to unions and so forth, which kind of dictates what we do with our insurance. Because we are under that umbrella, we don't really have the capacity just to go out as uh, human resources just, just point out to us just to shop everywhere because it's got to be completely apples to apples to what we have right now. It can't be anything different. You can't even change a doctor. You know, you can't take somebody's doctor away because that's the way it is. So at the end of the day, it's my intent to try and save money. But unfortunately, we're handcuffed to our incumbent provider right now. But to I'm sorry, to our broker is you know we're handcuffed to that broker because the incumbent. When the Blue Cross Blue Shield gives him a quote on insurance, his commission is tied to that quote because that's already a fixed number. So no matter where you get the quote from, as HR pointed out, you're competing against yourself. I mean, in other words, the numbers are always going to be the same. You know, it, you can't just go to another agency for something like this. So I'm lost. Then what are you asking to do? I think at the end of the day, all we can do is try anything we can to see if either we can. Let's put it this way. If his commission, well, let's put it this way. Rather than just sit here and just say, listen, Mr. Taxpayer, you're going to pay whatever it is, and we're not going to try anything, or at least if, if it's the smallest increment to say that maybe even if we suggested a, an RFQ, maybe there's something in-house, maybe something that a provider like any other broker might be able to say, maybe he can give you added value to what you can get along with the program, that could, be, that could be our last straw to actually giving some sort of advantage to us because right now well, there's no advantage to us. But are you going to tie a dollar value? Because you said this is about saving money. Added value comes in many different shapes and forms. There's still, there's Mayor, still sir, hang on, please. It comes in many shapes and forms, including, you know, service, you know, that, that might not be able to be quantified by dollars. If I heard Ms. Franzen right, you know, you could go to Broker A. They've got Blue Cross Blue Shield. You can go to Broker B. They've got Blue Cross Blue Shield. 
they're not going to bid against themselves. You can't. You're not going to save anything there. So then you're going to then you're asking us to maybe make a make a switch based on some unquantifiable you know value add that is not going to be tied to dollars because the only thing that's going to be tied to dollars is the amount that you're paying for these premiums. Right, but added value still has, when it says value, there's a cost behind the value too at the same time. Trustee, a better question would be is what did you have in mind to save money in, in an instance like this? What could you do to save money? I, 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 what would you do to save money? On, on insurance right now? Right. Yes. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you, you would go out to bid at the proper time. Is this the proper time? I don't know. I mean, when do the, you, you know, as far as they're being tied to union contracts, is this the proper time? What are, where and what are you going to save right now being tied into Blue Cross Blue Shield right now? I don't understand. Sometimes you may even have different brokers that are willing to, to get involved with your negotiations to help you with those costs and so forth then too. But that time is... So here. different brokers maybe take a lesser commission? Is no. that what you're saying? No, or? he could. I, I think at the end of the day, I think it's added value services. That's where I, that's the comment I made. So I'm trying anything I can to try and save not only the village money, but hopefully, let's put it this way, we can't do a whole lot as I just, I, I'm just going to repeat myself real quick. We can't do a lot about the actual premium because it is what it is. You're, you're married to this. And actually, I asked HR this morning, you know, whether or not we've even got confirmation from, let's say, Blue Cross Blue Shield to say, you know, just to, to keep our guy uh, honest, let's, uh, let's say, just to say, like, regardless of the quote we were given, have we ever been given the price from Blue Cross Blue Shield? No, we haven't. We need to do that just to make sure there wasn't any additional commissions tacked on there that we didn't know about. Could be, could have been like an administrative cost. We got to make sure everything's straight. Is That's what I'm doing. This this came up in the last. Call. I, we've been all here for five months, you know. So I mean, my question to the let's just say to the insurance committee is, where do you see us trying to save money for toward the village? I uh, Kathy, I can't think of his name. Um, the gentleman that um, comes out here with the health care, that does a lot of the research for the insurance. Um, if I hear his name, I'll know it. Mike. Mike. What's his last name? Mike Wojcik. Mike Wojcik, thank you. He um, sits on boards of health care uh, facilities. He goes to Washington all the time, and he's the one that it stays on top of this, getting us good costs and um, our benefits. I started, and I'll send it to the board, um, all of the beneficial things that we get for the services that we pay for here. So I think they've been very competitive. I think the time is too short to get anything close to what we're getting now. Um, <coughs> What, I've been asking for this for two months now, but it, it, I two more months. The and I was basically it. demanding this to be put on the agenda. Well, um, several weeks ago, did you send a letter to the broker to say that we wanted to terminate our services with we, them? The word terminate, and if you follow it the letter correctly, there. it was yeah. It, if you follow the letter correctly, the word terminate also underneath says that we could be terminating our services, but we may be renewing with you as well if your number's correct. But that was on. Um, workman's compensation insurance, not health care. Did that letter go to committee before it was sent to the... As an administrative, I, the committee still has to approve any change, but as an administrative task, I can inform the... But really, you can't... I, I never saw this letter. Really Did it say, you, it said could be terminated? I never saw this letter. So I'm just, I've read heard it referred to several apparently times. The, it apparently the insurance agent sent it to you, so read the letter. Well, well the Mayor, you should have sent it to us. Send it to me. You, you're... Finance director, you should send it to me. I'm the chair of the committee, and yeah. you didn't talk to the board or the committee, and you sent it out. And you don't have that authority. In the interest to of make saving the taxpayer money, that's what, that's I, that's what, what we do here too. You are, are not, not alone going, in that endeavor. We are not going to be renewing that until when we say Kent, May 1st. Well, you thought it was January 1st, but it was May 1st. You found that out after right. you sent the letter. So again. But for now, my recommendation, I'd like to hear from the other committee members on insurance, Trustee McLawhorn and Trustee Pierce. But I think um, I don't see the need to go out for a competitive seal bid personally. I mean, I just always believe that going out to bid is a good idea to make sure that the price that you're getting right now is the best price. Right. I mean, I also feel now while there may be rule, specific rules in terms of the network, on the actual health care provider and or the prescription drug coverage. I Over the years, I've seen a lot of fluctuation potentially in the costs of the life ADD 
STD and LTD. <coughs> so even if potentially we are tied, say, to the Blue Cross piece of it, there may be potential savings in those other pieces if we investigate the options and look to see what's out there. So, I mean, I guess I, I love the feeling it doesn't mean we're going to change just because we're going out for pricing, but it does confirm either that we're getting the best price right now or it opens our eyes to what other options are out there. Unfortunately, trustee, they won't quote anyone other than your incumbent. So you're going to get that price regardless. You, you can't. That's what, I would, that's what I'm kind of bringing this back um, to. And I guess I don't understand that because, I mean, I... I mean, yes, I the current broker can only quote Blue Cross, but Blue Cross is not the only insurance provider. Correct. There, there are multiple health providers out there. In right. addition, I mean, there's a whole boatload of life. Yeah, there are other disability. coverages that we can quote out, and we can quote out Blue Cross. Uh, let me correct that. We can quote out health insurance, but it's not going to be the coverage provided by Blue Cross. Right. It'll be provided by another carrier. Right. And the same is true for our short-term, long-term disability and those other uh, sequential coverages. Okay. So, obviously, trustees, we all know there's half a dozen companies out there, you know, Aetna, United Health, whoever, Humana, oh, there's a lot of companies out there. So, Who's been reaching out to these companies? Not me. What? I think that's part of what the discussion is. Do right. That's why it's on the agenda. But we looked at it last time when we had the renewal. And... The fact of the matter comes is that the present health care provider that we have submitted a cost. And then once it was determined that another person was going to submit a competitive bid, in essence, for that, the return cost came in, and apparently they decided that they were going to reduce that cost. That's the reality. So somewhere along the line, something had changed and it became, you know, their pencil got a little sharper. So I, mean, I can appreciate the mayor's viewpoint on this to sit there and reduce those costs. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, from the other side of it, it seems like it's an uphill challenge to be able to get somebody to go along with and maintain our present offering. So, Kathy, you would, from, and you are, you're our in-house insurance expert. You're saying that, as we just got, just to reiterate this one last time, if we were to go out to bid on the insurance, as long as, as I said, as long as it was apples to apples, everything that's being offered right now, even if it was through a different um, carrier, you know, a major company, that can be, we can facilitate that? Sure. Okay, because yeah, I, I was told can, to me that uh, that um, we can do it, but it will not be with Blue Cross, and right. it has to follow the parameters that have already been established in the contract. Which, again, should another, as the trust, as trustee Delzal just said, to say if you did go with another major company, there could be a potential savings there. I, you know, just say I'm just throwing a word out there: A Aetna or mm -hmm. Cigna, something like that, might be less expensive than Blue Cross. Then we don't know unless we try. Right. Can, can I? I have a minor asterisk. Uh, it has to fit the labor contracts and the village exactly. ordinance. Exactly. The village ordinance probably isn't going to bump up against anything. So. Okay. So, and, and that's all. I'm, that's the reason I use the apples to apples comparison. There's so there nobody's diminishing coverage for anybody. And we can't even guarantee that if that's taken to another carrier that they would be able to match that. So that's just the type of stuff that we might run into. We might we might go out to. You know, we might authorize bids for two, three different companies, but if they can't follow those parameters, they may pass. Right. Well, again, but that was... in that case, then at least we tried. I mean... Right. And it's a minimum of three bids when you go out. Well, you hope to get that. Right. Yeah, we've hope. certainly had other things where we've had a bidder. But we didn't ask for a bid, and we had a bidder. The board should have authorized that. And we have to be careful of the information that we give out from this village that shouldn't go out when people are bidding. So that said, in the interest of saving the taxpayer and the village money, in this case, because as, as HR pointed out, we are self-insured. Um, most participants are might be taking advantage of a 15% premium rate as opposed to the taxpayer of the village picking up 85% of that rate. 
would we have a consensus from the board to allow this to go, uh, the insurance to go out to bid uh, competitively with with getting at least three quotes? I just want to clarify something, if I may, if I may, please. The percentage is not going to change. Right. Right. Okay. So what are we? What are you going to quantify as a savings? So the the bids will quantify whether or not the right. percentage. I mean, we're still going to pay fifteen percent of the total cost. Sure. It's possible yeah. that the total cost comes down. But if down. the total cost is reduced by. Sure. Then then it's a savings. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a savings. So is it, is it just past practice to just require three bids, or can we require five? I'd well, like to see more. I'd like to see more than the regular brokers. It, it's a minimum, I think, of three that you're supposed to try and yeah. is, is achieve. Trustee, but the more, trustee, the better. As Trustee Dalzell pointed out, uh, it'd be nice to see as many as possible. But we've had situations where you've only had one, you've had two, and hopefully you get three. Not everybody yeah. wants to bid it. So yeah. it would be in their best interest, too. Enough. Currently, right three. now, the Village of Elsom spends over 3.5 million on health care insurance? I don't know why anybody wouldn't want it, would, would challenge that. I mean, it's in the interest of saving money if there's if there's the opportunity to do so. So, do we have a consensus to allow allow these to be bid? So this is just for health care. Yes. For no, listed. it's for everything that's listed. Well, everything right. that she listed Health, out. Health, right. dental, vision, life, yeah. ADD, STD, that's and LTD. Yeah. Right. I'm in favor of it. Me too. Okay. Trustee Tozal? Yes. Thank you. Trustee McGuire? I'm going to abstain. You have majority. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? I'll abstain. You're, you're, you're abstaining as well. I, okay. I just don't understand it all. So, so three out of five it trustees. Make much sense. So. Three out of five trustees did say they'd like to see a competitive bid. I just want raise quotes. I want to know the votes. Thank you, trustees. Um, Let's next. do the process properly this time, please. Yeah, I don't want to see that debacle that I per I witnessed out there in May with. And the I last. witnessed up here. <laughs> I don't want to see that again. Well, I think this is going through our HR as as they did through finance last. I don't know what a debacle was. It took it down to the wire as far as approval. That was about it. Well, it, the interested parties can come to me. I can provide census information, so we'll keep it consistent. But I mean, I I don't. I just I want to I want it to stay above board. I don't want to hear rumors of numbers switching at the last minute dealings. in the in the back room. I don't want to hear anything like that. I would agree with that. That's about as wrong as it gets. Yeah. Um, you can give an information out. Ordinance legislation, Trustee Pierce, anything else to cover? We covered the other oh, two no, items. No, sir, we have not. <laughs> um, we definitely have not. Um, so item one is discussion um, for approval to amend the number of Class C liquor licenses from three and not to exceed four. Said license will be issued to the owner of a new business at 1600 South Pulaski Road as the existing property needs to be rezoned from B1 special use to B3 business and liquor. Um, I will read into the record here uh, ordinance 4-67. No license shall be issued for the sale at retail of any alcohol alcoholic liquor within 300 feet as measured from building to building of any church, school, daycare center, child care facility, nursery or any business engaged in caring or or instructing children under the age of 18 years or home for the aged or indigent i can keep reading on but um i think that covers it for worth township i think that more due diligence needs to be done on this before this even would be considered to come up for a vote i think you're we're doing a disservice to this gentleman and his business because i don't think it, and i i'm going to seek a legal opinion um on the um, the distance and the and the and reading of this ordinance, I don't think you're doing this gentleman a, a, a service without looking into that first. I am going to call Mr. O'Sullivan tomorrow and, and ask him if he's canceled all of the Worth Township um, child programs and and what you know what it was it that I witnessed there tonight with all the children in the facility. Um, I don't believe enough due diligence was done on this. It is too close to a building that's been there longer than that's than that strip mall it doesn't meet the 300 feet um requirement so at the very least it should be referred to uh planning and zoning and or, or building and roger to measure that off um, the address of the facility of this um, 
uh, property is 11600. The address of Worth Township is 11601 Pulaski. What is the distance between the, the buildings? I don't believe it's 300 feet. 255. Oh, well, done. You measured already. <laughs> I think due diligence would be we do have village attorneys that can confirm what you are saying, Mayor. That's okay. All. It doesn't, but at least we have clarified. Uh, I guess we don't don't have to refer to building. It does not meet the re required distance if. Uh, legal, um, and I'll seek out that legal opinion, um, that uh, the wording of our ordinance, um, instruction of children under the age of 18, I would assume would include Lego clubs and babysitting classes and all of the different uh, activities at the Worth Township Hall. Please defer to the village attorney on that. I think I'm, I'm going to refer to the Legislative Council on that one. Uh, just to be clear, uh, Trustee Pierce, uh, you said it was for the caring of children and instruction? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yes, that is our ordinance, 4-67. Number Trustee, two is... Trust, excuse me, Trustee, let me ask you, you just brought that up. Why would you... Why would you go to legislative council if you have a village trustee? Mm -hmm. Village attorney. That's village. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, village attorney. Thank you. I'm. I'm. My right. You and I, you mayor, you and I have argued pretty hard on this one. Um, I'm just going to seek a legislative my, council on this. My disagreement would be is if you have a village attorney, you don't utilize them, but you go to a more expensive source. I'll pay for it. Thank you. I, that's on record. I will pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, number two, discussion for approval to amend the number of Class E liquor licenses from two and not to exceed four. Said license will be issued to the new owner of businesses at Red Roof Inn at 12340 South Cicero Avenue and Fun Times Square at 11901 South Cicero Avenue. The existing property needs to be rezoned from B1 to B3, business liquor. I, my opinion on the Red Roof Inn um, is, you know, one that has lived over in that neighborhood uh, for, the, for the past 17 years. Uh, living with the Deluxe Budget Motel, um, the facades are changing, but the sign, the name on the the, the building hasn't changed. Um, the loitering in the parking lot hasn't changed. I asked for a number of uh, things from uh, the mayor on this on this request, um, including the the I wanted to see a reduction in 911 and uh, police calls to this facility. The mayor, mayor, you put on there that that's NA, so I assume that's not applicable. You didn't feel it was applicable that I have that information. Not, so not on the new tenant. He's only been there for five months. Doesn't matter. It does not matter. I asked for the 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 facility. I didn't ask about the tenant or the owner. I asked for the facility. Well, you have a facility that isn't occupied by the same person anymore. Excellent point, Mayor. So you have an, uh, a, a, an owner that doesn't have a track record in a facility that does have a track record. Why not allow this owner um, the time to clean up the facility? And, and I think that that's how, that's how this was sold to us as well. You know, it's a red roof and it's going to clean up, clean up the, uh, lack of a better word, the, the mess that's over there and has been over there. Sure. Why not give him some time? Is his business dependent on the liquor and, and gaming license? I mean, his, his business is motel and hotel. His business is filling his rooms. Is, it, is his business filling a, a small room with uh, packaged liquor and, and gaming? There will be no packaged liquor. You have to consume in the, room, in the actual gaming space that's a 12 foot by 8 by 15 foot room that's adjacent to his office. And basically all that business was asking for was a competitive advantage to his business. I mean, in other words, uh, you know, the Baymonts, the, the Double Trees, all of them, none of those have gaming. So if he opens a business and he can offer that to his guest, he'd be lucky to get six people in that room, that kind of thing. And all he's going to have is a countertop with maybe a glass case cooler in order to offer beer or wine for consumption on premise. That's it. 
So all we can do, if the trustees don't want to support it, that's your choice. But my job is to actually listen to the business community and, if, and obviously try and facilitate this and bring it in if he meets the requirements. Yeah, Mayor, I can I can say that I, I agree with Trustee Pierce at this point in time. I mean, that location has had a very bad history. And I would like basically documentation or proof that the area, I mean, that we are bringing in a better clientele and that the issues that have happened there in the past did not stay or did not follow the new ownership. If we can prove that yes it it is a better environment then i i would be willing to revisit this at a future date i just think right now it's too soon and again like mike said you know the sign is still the same the appearance right now is still the same we don't know at this point in time that the clientele has actually changed so before allowing liquor and gambling i i would like to see something yeah. If I can comment on that too, I visited the uh, deluxe this past weekend. Um, the rear building that was redone already. Dude, your wife's right here. <laughs> <laughs> the, the rear building that has been refurbished. Um, they said the front building still has uh, four hour stays. The front building still has extended stays, which I thought was against our ordinance. Um, they said they, that wouldn't change until they refurbished the front building. So along with what trusting, uh, Trustee McClawhorn had said, I'm not against it as, as of right now, but I definitely don't want to do anything until we see a proven track record from him. That's the job of the board. That's fine. I also like to make a comment. I agree with Trustee Pierce also because I'd like to see them. It's a hotel, hotel. Let them get established in the community and go from there. And I appreciate the comments from the audience. Um, coming up too because I agree there's another side to this that needs to be understood also and the explosion of requests for liquor licenses um, and ga gaming video gaming is is incredible right now so I think we better slow down a little bit it just it just all of a sudden mayor I mean out of nowhere all of these requests for liquor I it just at some point we have to decide what town kind of town you know we want to be. I think that liquor light it, this is low hanging fruit. Yes, I agree, and I, and I hear you. You know we need to find ways to cut budgets, trim the fat. I think that was your term. Yeah. All of that. Increase. But revenue. this is this is this is low hanging fruit that preys on the most disadvantaged or you know the people that don't have it the most. It's too easy. These are tools that the state is offering businesses. The Let state, not the village. The state is offering businesses the opportunity to enhance their business. Basically, that's why you have a board to approve which, which you know, whatever they see is fit. But I certainly don't have a sign hanging out in front of the hall here asking to stop in to get a liquor license. This is a, pre, a prerequisite of what the state requires in order to have the gaming. Everybody wants to participate in gaming. When you go, we're actually incurring some business there that are coming into our village because current towns they're in don't offer that and they all want to take advantage of this kind of thing we are I'm not here to tell anybody how to manage their business but I am here to support them so I'm asking the same of the board if you feel that you're opposed to this for whatever reasons you are that's your prerogative that's what you get elected for is to make decisions so well, we support the businesses we also support the community and the residents as well because excuse me can't do that in here <laughs> and another thing when you take and get requests from businesses, you have to have, as I am, I'm trying to have an open mind to all these then, too, at the same time. Uh, I was told that uh, other administrations were very close-minded to this, and you don't have a line of people at the door trying to set up businesses in your town. They're trying to invest in our community, and we're trying to do our best to facilitate those then, too. Okay? It's unfortunate that we have to facilitate game, uh, liquor licenses in order to get the gaming, but that's what these... Is the one gentleman from Funtime said, I, let's put it this way, we, we're all entitled to an opinion, as, as the one young lady pointed out yet, too, as far as what they think is good, bad, or indifferent. We need to look at sources that help these businesses. Because otherwise, if he has to shut down that business for any reason, I don't know if there's a line of guys looking to open a batting cage outfit right now. You know, So you do what you have to to try and support these guys. It's on them. 
Well, sir, I mean, his his argument, and and I feel for the guy, and I feel for the fact that he's got a for sale sign up inside in in front. But his comparison with Hollywood Park in 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 Haunted Trails, it doesn't fly, sir. Those those two businesses have liquor under restaurant licenses. He does not have a restaurant inside of his facility. And according to our our own ordinances, 4-7, minors prohibited on premises. He would have to have a walled off facility. He does as well. He will have to with lick to, to, to serve the liquor. So you're, what we're saying is, yes, okay, we, we are going to separate those children from their parents. That's not the case in Hollywood because they're under a restaurant license. The minors are allowed to be in, their, in, in that restaurant setting with their parents to have liquor They're where they have their beer, the Chuck E. Cheese's and all of those. This is not what he has. He does not have a restaurant. So you're going to have a, you're going to have a child, children out in batting cages, go-karts, all of this stuff, separated from their parents. Because by, by ordinance, by state law, they can't go in there and find their parents. And as my wife, everybody knows that was my wife that came up here, <laughs> pointed out, we're gonna the, we, these people are going to consume alcohol and then go out and get into a, a you know a fast speed batting cage or go karts with children. Trusty, they could show paintballs. Too, yeah, they could, they absolutely, they can. But why? You know, this you're serving it to them. So, all right, let's move along. Next, uh, information technology, Trustee Dalzell. No report. Uh, human resource, Trustee McGrill. Um, Informationally, the wellness event, biometric screening, is going to be held October 31st, November 1st, and November 2nd. There will also be flu shots available at the same time. Both events will be held in the boardroom, and a schedule and invitation email will be sent out next week to all the employees, their covered spouses, and non-Medicare eligible covered retirees and their covered spouses. And this is another very excellent and effective program that's offered by our health plan. Thank you. Uh, health and Pollution, Trustee Pierce. Um, I put in everyone's mailbox the um, the citation report from Chief Miller and Ms. Caval. That's all I have, Mayor. All right. Traffic Safety, Trustee Dozal. I'm not going to go into it in depth uh, tonight, but uh, I'd just like to put out that I'd like to review some of the parkway bush or trees or whatever. Um, it, there's a couple locations in town that uh, that obstructs the traffic uh, view as you try to ease your way onto a, a street. And uh, I'd like to come up with some sort of methodology, not only for the residents, but uh, as well as when we looked at the presentation of the uh, different signage that we're going to start looking at along Pulaski. We'll make sure that that doesn't obstruct vision, especially at the sidewalks to where we start running over the people we're hoping that we'll spend some money at these locations. The other thing is is that uh, I'd like to uh, possibly contemplate having a no parking on 122nd Street for the north side of the school here. I would uh, fully lane. support that one. I've wanted that for years. Uh, I just, the last few times driving back and forth, especially in the evening hours, mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, I don't know how an ambulance navigates through there, and especially if they're reacting uh, to an emergency. So. Mm -hmm like just make that a kind of a clear traffic way for our police response as well as uh, emergency vehicles. Does that count during school hours? Isn't that how parents wind around the block to get their kids? All I'm talking about is parking. Parking, so okay. So standing is not waiting in line, right? Because that line goes around the block, you know, the, the traffic line. Yeah. And, and again, this is something that we had started the discussion with the school district on, and uh, Superintendent uh, Craig, he, he alluded to it but at some point in time the school district I think has to take the responsibility for the traffic it shouldn't be staged on the public streets causing a traffic concern so you know if that means that maybe we take the the north side of 122nd Street away from the uh, the apartment complex it's a it's a public street but I just want to make sure that we can respond to an emergency and uh, that we don't kill anybody trying to do that. How did you guys fix it over at Stone? I know that was a hot issue last year with the... Uh, I don't think it's been fixed. I don't think no. it's been fixed either. Yeah. There's a couple mm -hmm. proposals, I know, forth that they're going to use some of the, uh, mm -hmm. the property on the school itself in order to facilitate it. But you know as well as I do, when the uh, snow flies or rain, um, 
All the rolls go out the window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone might as well start part, painting their cars yellow because it becomes school buses. But that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, any presentations, petitions, or communications? Anybody? Tomorrow, again, folks, uh, opening day at Checkers Restaurant. Any unfinished business? A new business. Um, I do have one item, Mayor, uh, and I apologize. I missed it under uh, fire. I would like to add that we will have the uh, September activity report. Thanks. Um, before we adjourn, uh, we were told by legal we can start adjourning here uh, to go into a closed session if necessary. Uh, I actually called for a closed session to discuss an employee. Um, so can I ask, uh, we're going to adjourn first and then ask for a closed session after which. I have to, I got to talk with the clerk's office so we'll get this straightened out then too. So, um, motion to adjourn. Exactly, right. So, we're going to adjourn into a closed session. Can I ask someone to make a motion, please, for the closed session? I will make a motion to adjourn into closed session. Second. Okay, and can you stipulate what we're going in there for, please? How about to uh, discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, <laughs> discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or a legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity pursuant to 5 ILCS 120-2C1. Also, I'd like to add in there for litigation when an action against, affecting, or on behalf of a particular public body has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis for findings shall be recorded and entered in the minutes of the closed session meeting. <coughs> Pardon me, that's 5 ILCS 120-2 C11. Yes, second, please. Second. Roll call number one to go into closed session at 9.51 p.m. Trustee McGreal? Yes. <coughs> Trustee Dalzell? Yes. Trustee Pierce? Yes. Trustee Zielinski? Yes. Trustee Juarez is absent. Trustee McLawhorn? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So we're going to adjourn then, folks, and uh, trustees will see each other across the hall within five minutes, okay? Thank you. This is the only pile we need to Can we make it 10?